when I asked to be redistricted, the superintendent told me, sometimes life is tough and you just have to deal with it. Or the English teacher who said, it's not like you can go to college anyway in front of the class on the first day of school. College is an entirely different experience. The University of Illinois, much like University of Michigan, celebrates disability as diversity and provides many opportunities for students with disabilities to truly thrive. And I was so enamored with this new life where I didn't have to fight for basic access to take a class, let alone participate in extracurricular activities. So excited that I decided to stay and earn all three of my degrees and represented the Team USA in two Paralympic Games. But my research there focused on psychosocial identity development from a social justice perspective, emphasizing disability identity development. That is exploring how individuals develop a disability identity and meet, make meaning of their disability experiences. But as a researcher, I began to see many of those same attitudinal barriers that I experienced in high school and intersections with ableism that likely point to why the numbers are so low of researchers with disabilities. As a visibly disabled woman of color in the academy, how do you strike a balance of pointing out injustices and fighting for accessibility when also on the tenure track at a predominantly white institution? It's well documented that minoritized individuals in the academy receive more service requests and obligations. What about the additional labor to simply gain physical access or to navigate systems when there are access fails? and to be a champion of access and a model for our students with disabilities who seek out our mentorship. The juxtaposition is that this mentorship is often highly visible and can be recognized as positive leadership, but there's also this underlying tension of not wanting to be overcommitted, but still honoring your own identity as a researcher and as an individual. While racism and, and is discrimination or prejudice on the basis of color or someone's skin, ableism characterizes someone as defined by their disability often in, that, in a negative way. This ideology privileges those who do not have a disability. And I wanna note that I have a very visible disability that I can't really hide except a little bit on Zoom where I've learned that I have to intentionally disclose it. But there's many individuals who have less apparent or hidden disabilities who grapple with that layer of disclosure every single day. So my story tries to interrogate some of these tensions, but as a scholar of disability identity development, I also think about how these experiences shape a person's disability identity or a person's disabled researcher identity. What are some of those systemic barriers faced by activist scholar researchers? For me, there were numerous ones, like when my graduate student could not submit her IRB document because the submit button was not coded properly to be screen reader compatible. Or when I was supposed to be attending a search committee dinner for a disability related position, I held a joint appointment. So it happened within my university at the time, but not my home department. I was on that search committee. And so communication, you know, was a little bit slow to trickle down to me. But nonetheless, I took the obligation seriously, knew in order for me to weigh in about the candidate, I needed to actually meet the candidate, despite a series of rather comical and likely could have been avoided scheduling conflicts, as some of you can probably relate to. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend their talk, but I see dinner with the search committee on the agenda. Great, I think at least I'll have that. It was one of those days running around try, from here to there, really wishing I could clone myself, grabbed my trusty suit jacket hanging on the back of my door for emergency. I forgot I had to look presentable occasions, got in my car and entered the address for the said restaurant into my phone. And then there was a little pit in my stomach that was like, oh no, my destination was an inaccessible restaurant. At least I was 99% sure of that. I was beginning to second, my second guess myself, panicking, and also realizing that I was driving there in rush hour because I was also still new to the city and had not figured out the traffic patterns. You know, at a red light, I texted a leader at the university, a friend, an ally, a mother of a multiply disabled son, a confidant, a woman who has navigated higher education, asked for the semi-urgent professional advice needed in, if she happened to be available, explained the situation, and you know, she said, I think I'd make a game day decision. How do you feel? And I said, well, frankly, pretty frustrated, you know, and ju just was trying to sort it out. I channeled all of, so I channeled the issue afterwards, all through the all appropriate parties, chains of command, got apologies, reassurances that it was not intentional. It would not happen again. Um, I was able to gain access through a back door, super steep, not up to code ramp that was in by the dumpster. Um, but I felt like I needed to still go and meet this candidate. So, cause it was not the candidate's fault. And that was the, that was the, the first and foremost. 
but this particular search, um, you know, ended up ultimately being a failed search and repeated again next year. Imagine my dismay when I saw the same restaurant on the agenda the following year. As I said, I do not wish these types of experiences on anyone, but what happens when you don't have a community to process this, to troubleshoot, to validate the frustrations, not to mention the time chosen to try to make a difference more systemically? This is one of countless stories of instances of ableism that is likely contributing to those statistics mentioned earlier. I mean, I predict that, that, that the number of, of disabled researchers and faculty would be much higher if instances like this didn't happen, if instances of, of just being exhausted of navigating constant ableism within the academy didn't perpetually happen. These numbers are discouraging given that roughly 61.4 million Americans are disabled. So I call on us to ask, how can we do better? One way has been Nidler's longtime commitment, as, as Dr. Mead mentioned, of, of commitment to train the next generation of researchers. We have two mechanisms for that, the Mary E. Switzer program and the Advanced Rehabilitation Research and Training Program to increase capacity for high quality rehabilitation research and to support grants to institutions to, to really start to fill, to fill this, this gap. During my time as director, I have goals to increase that representation of disabled researchers within these mechanisms and disabled researchers of color from other underrepresented backgrounds. Our research is stronger with diversity. And when I say researchers with disabilities, I truly mean all types of disabilities, apparent and non-apparent, low support needs, high support needs. I wanna challenge the field to not be complacent with the binary of disabled or not but to actively seek out these future scholars. Maybe perhaps it's undergraduate students in your class, pull them aside, ask them if they've ever considered a PhD. There's a high likelihood that nobody's ever talked to them about that career path. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to admit this, but I didn't know what a PhD was. For athletic, for athletic eligibility reasons, I enrolled in a second master's program late all the classes were full, so I accidentally ended up in a doctoral seminar, seminar class. And a couple weeks later, when the instructor figured out that I already had a master's degree, voluntarily did an honors, a senior honors thesis that was published in an academic journal, and that I actually loved research and writing, I was then presented with a form to reapply under the PhD program. This leads me to my second point, and I, and I really do wanna also plant the seed. I, I worked with over 50 students at all levels through, throughout the work of my, of my re former research lab and committees. And notably over time, that included many disabled students from other universities, which again, fills a national mentorship void that students with disabilities are often overlooked for research positions or discouraged from careers in the academy. I joked that it seems that students with disabilities just magically would find me. And that's pretty much how my research lab was formed. But it was a beautiful blend of students from all academic levels with many unique disability and chronic illness groups represented, which again made me a better researcher. As I shared, I, I realized myself how rampant ableism was in the academy, but I learned more about those experiences from these individuals and the lack of supports that they were facing, the lack of knowledge about disability related research that many of their own advisors did not have. So I navigated administrative hurdles to ensure that students from other universities could be active participants in my lab. And so I raised the question, is that something that more of us could also do? So now in my role as Nidler Director, I wanna work with grantees like, like you all and future grantees, like I hope some of you will be, to ensure support in the pipeline and a community of folks. I want to plant the seed and encourage everyone here in this Zoom room to be brave enough to include positionality statements in your work about your own and your team's disability status. This will help to make the less apparent more apparent and to give confidence to students who may not realize that this could be a career path for them. As a researcher, I began to see many of these same attitudinal barriers in, in, in all levels of, of the systems of research that prevent or prohibit or make more challenging to have participants with disabilities in our studies. Everything from the derogatory and insulting language adopted by many IRB protocol forms to disability not being important enough to include as a key demographic variable, let alone it not being that binary, that non-binary question about disability. 
My other frustration was hearing about evidence-based randomized control trials being implemented or studied across, for example, an entire school district. But then in the fine print, you learn that students with disabilities were omitted because they don't need social emotional learning skills? No, I don't think so. Research must include all of us. The disability and chronic illness community is so diverse, rich, and beautiful, but oftentimes research takes place only with, uh, with one specific type of disability in mind. I do want to say sometimes this is extremely helpful for depth of a particular issue, deeper knowledge for that particular population, or something that uniquely affects that population. But I also want to encourage us to consider the implications and for the broader disability community as well. In our work at Nidler, I want to include individuals with apparent and non-apparent disabilities across as many disability groups as possible, physical disabilities, psychological disabilities, intellectual disability, sensory, learning, behavioral health, chronic illness. We also need to include COVID-19 long haulers in the work that we're doing. We are the, we are the strong community to, and to be a support for them. We also need to be intentional about including people with varied backgrounds and experiences from underserved and underrepresented communities. That diversity of the disability community is such an asset and our work must be as, as inclusive as possible. As research participants throughout my career, we became intentional about various things to, to such as making sure that the anchors for scales were developed with um, age appropriate visual aids. Um, we modified interview protocols to allow individuals who were not speaking the interview or typing the interview to use alternative or augmentative communication devices and worked with software developers to improve the, the programming of commonly used survey tools such as REDCap and SurveyMonkey. Our research was more valuable as a result. It's a combination of both ensuring our processes are inclusive and our protocols to allow for accommodations, the same way that accommodations exist in the real world in school or the workplace. We must translate that into our research. I know it's hard. I know it's messy. It's the right thing to do for the 61.4 million Americans with disabilities in our country. As director of Nidler, I want to bolster the ways that we involve people with disabilities across that entire research process and the research enterprise, meaning also the grant review panels, our, our staff of program officers, and hey, directors. I've shared with, my, with you my thoughts on the pipeline within academic institutions and the ways that Nidler is working to provide mechanisms to help fund that pipeline. For example, another, another piece related to process, for the first time there is a requirement in our funding opportunity announcements for grantees to describe how they would obtain and incorporate input of individuals with disabilities and other key stakeholders to shape the proposed research activities. And then this was an evaluation criteria that peer reviewers had to also rank applicants on, as, as Dr. Mead mentioned. We have things in the works to help other agencies to incorporate language like this and are working to explore and bolster other grant mechanisms within ACL. Part of it is to give us a metric of how we're doing and to actually contribute to these overall statistics. And while we do collect information on disability status across our programs, we know it's still severely underrepresented and perhaps not being disclosed. We're actively studying other federal minority fellowship programs hoping to leverage disability researchers in these existing spaces and to explore bolstering of our own fellowship programs to target this particular shortage. It's imperative to the disability community that nothing about us without us. And I've also recently heard from the community that some folks have modified this to nothing without us, period, full stop. I do not want the involvement of people with disabilities to just be a checkbox or an afterthought. Too often people with disabilities are an afterthought. While this is, as I said, an exceedingly complex issue to tackle, it's so important that we're gathering here today in spaces like this to have these conversations and to share our research with each other. We're all a part of the solution and we need disabled and non-disabled individuals to commit to the future of our field. We need folks inside academia, inside the government and from our communities to make this a truly symbiotic relationship. With Nidler's overall mission being to fund the research and demonstrate these training and provide technical assistance in order to help individuals with disabilities of all ages through our grant programs and fellowships, I am personally committed to being that representation that I always wanted and helping others to be that representation for others. 
so that we as a community can build our disability research community to be as rich and as diverse as we know that the disability community itself already is. In closing, I have just two things for, to, to leave you with. One, apply to Nidler for grants or to be a peer reviewer. And two, commit to recruiting at least one new disabled and underrepresented individual to your lab or a research project this year. It's through that that we are going to really make a difference in our own disability research community. Thank you. Wow, thank you. That you said so much that just resonates and that is so important. Um, I know we have a bunch of clapping and I'm sure a bunch of questions. Uh, if you're okay with uh, taking some of them? Absolutely. Okay. Um, are any specific hands up? Uh, Dr. McKee, do you have a specific comment or question? And then I will look for hands that are up. Thank you so much. Um, no, this is really great. And it's also, I uh, just want to highlight the importance of having that life experience, um, having someone like you direct a funding agency, um, it's, it's really, um, it's been long overdue. Um, I know we have also uh, struggled even with NIH, um, just even including people with uh, different types of disabilities, there's often just very siloed. And so that's been a continued struggle. So I'm excited uh, that you're there and I'm hoping uh, that that will also resonate with across other funding agencies and um, hopefully make this truly, um, truly a, a meaningful change going forward. And I do have one uh, quick question for you in terms of our recruitment for people with disabilities. Um, I agree and it resonates that when you say, um, you know, we need to encourage, I know even growing up, um, I was, um, you know, kind of not encouraged to go into uh, medicine or even doing research just because they've never really had an experience for a deaf individual going through there. And so um, in terms of uh, the encouragement is one aspect in our medical uh, fields, um, sometimes we're often competing with very limited funds in DEI. And I was just curious if you have uh, strategies to not just um, kind of compete with others because they also are really a value uh, part of the team and so how can we really break through that mold and really uh, make this a larger picture um, and have this be representative for our patient and research team force? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. And thank you for that. And I think that it's a I think the answer is a both and in that I think that what we need to do is yes, to include disability as a as um, a, a recognized component within some of these existing mechanisms. But I but I also believe that we need our own mechanisms too. And so uh, and, and, you know, maybe that's just me being a little bit greedy in that way. But I think that but I think that and, and the reason why I say that is because I, I believe that that um, that we we don't want to say that that other racial groups and other other um, underrepresented communities are more important or less important than disability. But but we need. But if you're if you're adding, you know, 61.4 million additional, you know, individuals into that pool like that that pool might not be big enough you know and so and so that's where maybe it maybe it is um like a um a, a, a parallel um strand within some of these um within some of these existing uh, mechanisms or maybe it is its own standalone and so um we are we are actively really really trying to trying to tackle that question and to understand what from a numbers perspective really does make sense what from a um, from a practicality standpoint, makes sense in terms of implementation as well, trying to not reinvent the wheel totally. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Reber, you had a question? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Pratt. That was very, uh, very inspiring. Um, in my research, I've, I've met some killer smart women of color with disabilities from low income communities who want a higher education. Um, but they're unable to attain one. And I'm just curious um, if you know about the mechanisms, the, the scholarships, not loans, that are available to, to target these groups. And are, are you aware of them? 
yeah. out there? Yes. So, so, and I, and so I think part of it is it's it's two different questions of whether we're ta you're talking funding of undergraduate education versus graduate education, simply because the the mechanisms tend to be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, but I would be more than happy to share. I have a I have a running list of resources um, for individuals with disabilities in terms of for undergraduate education, and then we have um, I have a it's a I will say it's a smaller list of resources, but a, a, it's it's growing over time. A list of resources of professional associations who provide graduate level support um, specifically for individuals with disabilities to obtain uh, more advanced degrees. So I would be more than happy to share that with you. Um, if, if I'll put my email here in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Or if you send it to me, I can oh, perfect. Send it forward and, po and post it on our website. As well. Perfect. Um, Patricia Anderson. Hi, Dr. Forber Pratt. Um, you mentioned that 4% of faculty nationally are disclose or register as having a disability. And I had recently discovered that here at Michigan, our statistics show that 4% of faculty say they have a disability. Um, my reaction was horror. I was thinking, you look at all of the other categories that are tracked, and they're either close to the state or national numbers or above. Mm -hmm. And disability is the only one that is not just below, but like really hugely, significantly below. In Michigan, one in three adults has a disability and 4% of the University of Michigan faculty. Um, and I started thinking, why, why is this category so out of line with the others? Why do we think that it's okay that this category in diversity is so out of line with representation? Mm -hmm. And we have anecdotal information, but we don't really have data. Um, and the, the, the way, the path to getting the data is problematic because people are terrified of disclosing. Yep. I personally have known multiple people who disclosed invisible disabilities and were forced onto disability and out of the university or fired. And these, these stories, this is why people won't disclose. But without disclosure, we don't have the data to justify allocating resources and support to change the story. And it's a catch-22. And I'm feeling both horrified and trapped. And how do we, A, get people to feel safe to disclose? Mm -hmm. And how do we get the data in a way that helps people feel safe about disclosing? And how do we do something about the stigma so that people actually accept their disability as part of their identity? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a complex question, but a very important one. And so I appreciate, I appreciate that. I think that, I think that one way is to leverage and to and to request that that uh, professional organizations in general that are tracking the, this these types of elements of diversity across across colleges and universities that they take this up because that's a a little bit more protection than if the university or college itself is is trying to is taking it up. So one example, um, the American Association of University Professors, like work like having key individuals with disabilities to work with them on a the importance of asking the questions, the sensitivities around asking the questions, but also in terms of that implementation. And um and and that it, and that's not an easy thing to just you know do overnight. I I I do recognize that. I also, <clears throat> excuse me, I also am not sure if with your um, campus, I'm assuming it was like a campus climate survey or something, something along those lines. Okay. Um, I'm also very curious whether, whether that 4% 
what that breakdown was of, of tenured or tenure track faculty versus clinical faculty versus adjunct faculty. And um, because I, I predict that, 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 we're, that, it, that it gets worse as we, as we disaggregate is, is what, I, what, I, what I predict, but, I, but, but nowhere have I seen that data that's really, that's really disaggregated in, in, that, in that type of way. Um, for a lot of the reasons that you're that you're that you're talking about, um, and and it's and it's hard. I mean, it, it it's hard to to um, you don't want to give somebody false false hope or false uh, support that oh you know that you know by disclosing this you're going to be fine and et cetera because we know that's just not that's not always the case. And so um, I think we need to think creatively and think about other mechanisms to allow and ensure protections for individuals um, to, to be able to disclose in, in anonymous ways, but, but that can be, that can be, give the snapshot that's needed. Wonderful. Not a great answer. It's a complicated problem. Mm -hmm. And one that we have to keep working on. Yes, and we, and we all need to keep working on it. Yes. Yep. Dr. Zazov, you had a question? Thank you. I want to reiterate, thank you again for a very inspiring talk. I have one comment and one question. The comment is somebody, one of our mission officers made a quote that I thought was very appropriate to this conversation. And he said, when people with disabilities apply who have been successful in college, they are probably more likely to be successful than people who don't have disabilities because of what they've had to overcome to get here and still do well. I thought that was a very useful insight. My question, have you, and maybe you have, thought about how we can leverage the economic benefit of having more people with disabilities be successful in terms of fewer people being in social security and disability insurance and so forth because they are productive. Yeah. Um, has that been part of any um, criteria for grant or funding? That's interesting. I have not seen it as as criteria in grants or, in grants or funding, but I have been engaging um, in several conversations and reading some wonderful work that's put out by the National Disability Institute. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, but they're one of the more robust groups that has really dug deeply into the economic um, layers um, affecting people with disabilities and how and how the, that affects longer term outcomes and they've also dove into national data um, by disability and race and um, and and um, so I would highly encourage um, looking at some of their stuff um, we I'm I'm very open to to learning more and to in trying to think about the ways that we can incorporate um, aspects of that or or um, or leverage an expansion of some of that that type of work um, because I think it's sorely needed. I think there's a lot of misperceptions out there. Um, and for example, just about like the able accounts is a great example where that can really help and doesn't work against individuals. But there's so, so many misperceptions about about that um, that 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 is out there within the general disability community. Um, and I learned relatively recently that the of the of the existing able accounts in in the in the country majority of them have, have the an average balance of only about seven thousand dollars which might not seem like a lot but that's but that's protection for those dollars so that you can still receive the services and and supports that that, that you need so it was just it was an, an important um an important piece and and also to just a, a quick comment on reflecting on the, the 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 comment that you made i always say that people people with disabilities we are natural problem solvers because we've had to be. And that translates mm -hmm. to um, incredible leaders and thinkers within in the employment settings of being able to problem solve because it's it, it, when you know when I was teaching in the university it's not that you know that there's a recipe for everything that you oh my goodness you actually have to problem solve and think on your feet and um, and and I just find that people with disabilities tend to be far more 
far more um, uh, successful in the, with that skill set just because of the the life experience and 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 constant um, having to navigate and re-navigate. Wonderful. I agree. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tara Mana. Hi. Uh, thanks, Dr. Forber Pratt. I really appreciated your presentation. Really resonated with me as a disabled person who's been a student at multiple universities and worked at multiple universities. And I'm thinking about sort of one of the issues, particularly for students, is that, you know, the resource center that we typically have access to, we're generally thought of like exclusively as a service user and not sort of having those more robust scholarship supports and, and things like that. And it's more like of a like regulatory arm almost. And so I'm wondering if you know of other mod of models that are are good and are more expansive in terms of the sports that they provide for students with disabilities um, at universities across the country. Uh, so there's been a movement of um, of some universities that are pushing for uh, cultural centers on disability. So the same way that that you might have a, a Latinx house or a, a you know African American center or, or LGBTQ center wanting a cultural space for uh, students with disabilities to to be not the not the place where you go for testing accommodations, not the place where you go, like you said, for some of those more regulatory um, pieces, but to but to fill that gap of of the sense of community, of a sense of just support for one another and and by the community. And so um, we're seeing, and I and I don't remember the number off the top of my head, the number of, of universities that have that have embraced that that particular model. Um, but that, but I know that 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 is one one piece that we that we are seeing I think that, that but you're another really important piece about your question is in either in either case whether it's the service provision centers or, or um, you know uh, services there or these cultural centers are we also encouraging um, that 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 pathway and supports with it for assistant ships for example and RA ships and things like that and I would I would I would dare to say that I don't think we are and I think that one of the things that we need to try try to really do is to work with um, like graduate student councils at universities um, and and uh, and mechanisms within universities to to draw to draw the importance of the what I, what I say is like the added cost of just being disabled and and um, and and how that the benefit of of an assistantship like that really. Um, really is a, is a need for individuals with disabilities. So I would say we need to attack, attack that one from multiple issues, both within the universities and, um, and outside. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one more question and that's it. Els? Let's see if she can get on unmute. Oh, do Elle? you hear me? Yes, now. Okay, well, thank you for the wonderful presentation. And I realize the importance of inclusion and participation. I'm involved in the political science emerging scholars conference uh, activities, and we will certainly push harder for including students with disability in this kind of program. But the question that I would like to ask Dr. Anjali is um, you, you pointed out the importance of data and are you endorsing uniform, uniform data in particular one that is developed by the World Health Organization in a classification of functioning? So um, that's my question. Yeah, that's a yes, that's a great question. So. There are several um, working groups that I am a part of where we're, we're trying to get folks to play nice with one another and to have uh, a common uh, common data elements that, that we are using consistently for, for a lot of these reasons. It is like herding cats, let me just say, um, in terms of trying to get folks to, um, to agree. We, we, we've looked at, it, at, at um, the, the World Health Organization's um, uh, ways of asking questions 
questions. We've looked at this, the, the commonly used now adopted by the CDC, the, the six questions, if you will. Um, but the, the issue that we that we keep finding is that folks will start with with something like that and then and then they sort of deviate on their own, which then which then adds to the complexities that we're that we're talking about. So um, I don't have a great answer other than I can say there's a lot of people that are working really hard to try to get that level of consistency and 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 I am personally advocating that we need to have this consistency, um, not just here in the United States, but but also internationally for for these reasons. Just, I think institutions of higher ed are a prime example of of you know we we support students and faculty members from um, from all around the world, and so I think it's an imperative that we that we are also contributing to that data um, on on an international level as well. Um, so it is a work in progress, but a very important a, a very important piece of this of this puzzle. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, once again, as you see in the comments that your uh, talk, your voice very much resonated with those in the group. I believe you'll probably find a lot more individuals applying to Nidler from this yes. group um, <laughs> and recognizing it. I think there is, has been a lot of work across the different funding mechanisms. And so getting people to from the different departments to all be talking and leveraging each other's work, recognizing it and building on it is one of the key things that we keep wanting to do here. And I think needs to keep being done across the country. So thank you again for being here and being part of it. Um, we're very excited about your position and how you're gonna bring change and thank highlight you. the importance of disability and intersectionalities. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, it's going to be uh, hard to uh, move on, I think, from that. This it brought us so much to think about. It's such an exciting um, ideas and presentations that we were discussed, but I really think they resonate throughout the rest of this conference. Um, so the next presenters that we're going to hear um, are those uh, talking about the experiences of individuals with disabilities. Uh, at 9.50, in just a minute, we'll talk about, hear about the maternal health experiences of black, deaf, and hard of hearing women in the United States. We'll then hear about emergency room communication experiences, later life mobility limitations. Um, and then we'll begin to get into some suggestions. At the end of these, five presentations, we'll be having a breakout group. Uh, individuals will be assigned to specific rooms um, with the folks who stay in the main room are having access to the CART provisions. Um, once again, uh, these are, we've left 13 minutes for these presentations that includes about a 10 minute presentations and maybe one answer or one question and answer depending on when uh, things complete, but it will all depend on our timing and movement forward. So with that, I am going to move on and allow uh, Hila Hem to take the screen um, and share her slides. Good morning, everyone. Hello, my name is Kayla Helm. I'm a clinical subjects coordinator in the family medicine department. And today I'll be presenting maternal health experiences of black, deaf and hard of hearing women in the United States. This research was done in collaboration between the University of Michigan, Rochester Institute of Technology and Brandeis. It was funded by the National Institutes of Health and the authors have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Just an accessibility point, I'm a dark-skinned dark Black woman wearing a UM sweater with a Michigan M, and in my background, there is a tapestry with a tree. So just to get started, I want to give some context about maternal health in the United States and the experiences of birthing people with disabilities. The U.S. has pretty alarming mortality rates. Between 1990 and 2013, they have increased by 136 percent. 
And even while living in a high income country, many women face an increased mortality rate of about 5.8%, which is higher than many other developed countries. Women with disabilities face increased risks for inadequate prenatal care, antenatal and postnatal complications, delivery of low birth weight infants and preterm births. There's also a higher risk of pregnancy and birth complications for deaf and hard of hearing women. Another marginalized community that experiences disproportionate rates of adverse pregnancy outcomes and experiences is Black women. Between 2011 and 2016, the pregnancy-related mortality rate for Black non-Hispanic women was over three times greater than their white non-Hispanic counterparts. There's also a higher incidence of disability among Black Americans, and a recent study found that pregnant, deaf, and hard of hearing women were actually more likely to be Black. The few research studies that have studied both race and disability have shown that the compound effects of these marginalized identities could result in adverse maternal health experiences and outcomes. This brings me to the theoretical framework that shaped the sub-analysis. Intersectionality is an analytical framework for understanding how aspects of a person's social political identities combine to create different modes of discrimination and privilege. This means that disparities in maternal health care cannot be attributed solely to disability or race, but rather to their complex interplay. And with intersectionality in mind, we aim to ask new questions with an existing data set. So we applied this framework after primary data collection for a larger qualitative study that aimed to examine the health care experiences and outcomes of deaf and hard of hearing women in the United States. And we hope to use intersectionality to ground our understanding of our subgroup analysis goal, which is to look at and understand the numerous unmet needs, barriers, and facilitators that Black, deaf, hard of hearing women face before, during, and after their pregnancy. So the larger qualitative study had women recruited from two research sites, Chicago and Rochester, and then online nationally. In order to participate in this study, you had to be between the ages of 21 and 50, had self-reported pregnancy or a recent birth of a child within the past five years. Each participant had a 90-minute open-ended semi-structured interview with questions adopted from a previous study on pregnancy and women with physical disabilities. It was also informed by a deaf and hard of hearing advisory panel. I'll just say DHH for now. Participants were asked about their barriers and facilitators to their care, as well as sources of information and support. However, it's really important to note that there were no explicit questions referring to race. For this subgroup analysis, there were eight participants that had self-identified as Black or biracial. One of their identities were Black. Their ages ranged from 23 to 43, and the mean was 35. Given the study's focus on racial and ethnic identities, as well as hearing status, it is important to discuss author and interviewer positionality. Individuals were invited to self-identify. Of our two interviewers, one was a white deaf woman and another a non-deaf ASL fluent female interpreter of Puerto Rican descent. Our writing team included individuals with a wide range of identities, including two hearing women of color and a deaf man. For qualitative analysis, we used deduce and had deductive coding based on a previously developed code book with emergent inductive codes added to reflect answers that were more unique to the Black DHH maternal health experience. So this included things like cultural support. Two authors collaboratively coded the transcript after collaboration and any coding disputes were discussed in real time to reach a consensus. Major themes were determined by code application frequency and their fit within our intersectional framework. The first of which I would like to discuss is familial and cultural support. So for each major theme, I'm going to talk about some of the unmet needs and barriers, as well as the facilitators. Multiple participants commented on wanting more healthcare providers and interpreters who shared their racial backgrounds. For example, one said having POC interpreters and providers will help her feel more supported. 
culture understanding empathy. I need my people of color for support when I am in pain and emotional. Another participant was acutely aware of how her race could impact her treatment. She identified a potential provider belief that black patients tolerate more pain leading to her issues being ignored. She said, our concerns are not being taken seriously or providers think we are being dramatic. This woman also went to state that her identity is complicated and stressed that part of understanding her experiences is considering both her deafness and her black identity. She said, it is hard for me to talk about a part of myself slash my identities without including another part. They are all connected to me. So many of these barriers seem to be alleviated by the facilitator of having familial and cultural support. Many describe their family as a critical part of their support system, often to fac facilitate communication when interpreters were not available. They helped assist in advocating for communication accommodations and provide emotional support. Several participants also highlighted the cultural support they received from providers who were either POC themselves or were much more knowledgeable about how to communicate with deaf and hard of hearing women effectively. For example, one said, one POC nurse was very sweet and helpful when I was struggling to breastfeed. She was very caring and tried her best to communicate with me, writing and going close up to me. This leads me to the next major theme, knowledge and educational opportunities. So this first story of an unmet need and barrier describes a participant's experience when their newborn died due to complications from a uterine inf infection. She stated, I wish the OBGYN had told me I had a uterine infection, but she didn't know because I only told her I had been having a little cramping and she said it was probably from stress. When recalling her son's death, death, she explained that she tried to understand the difference between cramping and stress throughout her pregnancy. Despite her attempts, there was miscommunication regarding which potential symptoms to look out for and their impact on her eventual birth experience. When she tried to make sense of what happened, her doctor failed to provide an adequate explanation. All he said was that he didn't know why and he didn't understand. This failure highlights a missed opportunity from a provider to remedy knowledge gap. Other participants expressed a desire for providers to have cultural sensitivity training. One said, take cultural sensitivity training class, some for POC and some for the deaf. This participant also stated that they wished that their resources that were available were culturally sensitive or friendly. In terms of facilitators, many talked about taking birthing classes with an ASL interpreter or addressing information gaps by finding community with other mothers, for example, using a social media group for deaf moms. The next major theme I would like to discuss is communication accessibility. Many participants talked about some unmet needs and barriers that involved having lack, a lack of consistent communication. For example, one said they couldn't understand everything. They didn't have an interpreter at birth. Another stated, sometimes I do not understand terminology used by hearing people and I'm embarrassed to ask what it means. Looking back, I wish I spoke out more and talked to someone and found a group. I could have developed that group with deaf and POC mothers. And the main facilitator for this was just having a sign language fluent provider and having an interpreter. This really ensured language accessibility and that the participants communication needs were met. For example, one had a provider that sim comms, which is signing and talking at the same time. Another had an interpreter and stated that if there wasn't one there, the communication would have been lost. So this leads me to discuss some of the project's main findings. First of which is that Black DHH women experience many of the same issues as their white counterparts. This is especially the case when it comes to communication accessibility, and it's important to remember that the ADA specifies that healthcare communication must be effective and accessible. So this means that healthcare providers and staff need to recognize their legal mandates to ensure equitable communication access. But unique to the Black DHH mother's experience was needing care aligned with and aware of their intersection, the intersecting racial and deaf experiences. And this 
definitely parallels other studies that demonstrate the benefits of having providers with a concurrent background. Overall, these responses show the importance of familial and cultural support, accessible communication for having a healthy pregnancy. Some limitations is this is a limited sample. The subgroup analysis didn't have questions specific to racial identity, and there was a lack of racial concordance between interviewers and interviewees. I just want to touch on a few major takeaways, the importance of communication accommodations, accessible information, emotional support and compassionate care is vital throughout pregnancy and birth, and cultural awareness is also important to fully acknowledge the maternal experiences of Black DHH women. Some ideas for future research include having a study with race and ethnicity in mind from the start that would allow for more in-depth analysis of the maternal health experiences that are unique for Black DHH women, also utilizing other demographics to fully demonstrate the compounding effects of identity. I wanna thank everyone that helped make the sub-analysis possible and for providing support throughout this process. Here's my information. Thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the symposium. Wonderful. Um, we have a minute or for any present, any questions? Um, we have clapping hands. Any questions? My one comment is that um, you obviously the it was it's good to see at least that the environment felt safe enough that these messages can come out. And so I think the issue of concordance is important for both interpretation um, and for being open to listening. Uh, I think too many times with interviews and focus group. Um, people may not feel safe or supported. And so it is important um, to think about um, the, the environment that is set up and the messages that are provided, whether explicitly um, or implicitly by how we create, create them. If you have comments about that, that would be wonderful. Um, no major comments. It's just a major limitation of the study because it's a sub analysis. Mm -hmm. um, this was something that was just more of a passion of mine doing something intersecting disability and race. So that's yeah. kind of what created the opportunity to do a more focused qualitative analysis. Mm -hmm. But in the future, I mean, even with some of the future research that's being done for the R01, we are talking about how could we have questions that more explicitly ask about race. Um, Dr. Zazo, you had a question? <laughs> Yeah, thank you for this. When I was doing OB 20 years ago, I actually delivered a fair number of deaf women. And I agree with you, there's a huge communication barrier between them and the staff. My question to you here, and I realize you had a small number of eight or nine, I can't remember people. You kind of deaf and hard of hearing. Were most of them deaf, capital D deaf, or were there some hard of hearing people too? That's a really good question. Of the eight participants, six identified as deaf, two as hard of hearing. Six identified as capital D deaf, to clarify. Yeah, because there may be different experiences too, it's hard to know. Yeah, that's definitely true. Some of these participants conducted interviews in sign language, others were using spoken English. So there's definitely a wide range, range of experiences for people who are ASL users, many of which were because they needed interpreters. And that's a lot different from some of the communication accessibility needs of those that are hard of hearing and just need different sorts of accommodations. Thank you. Wonderful. No Thank you so we'll much. I'll be moving on to our next presentation. Um, please feel free to email questions or put them in the chat directly to the presenter if you do not get to um, say them. Dr. McKee? Yeah, I just want to let everybody know uh, for any future presenters, just to make sure that you talk at a uh, normal pace. Um, I know there's a lot of materials that will be shared um, for the cart, just to make sure that we capture it all. So thank you. Um, and we'll go ahead, uh, move forward to Dr. James, uh, Natalie yeah, James. Hi there, thank you all. Are you all able to see my screen currently? Uh, you should be able to see the PowerPoint at this point. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for the thumbs up, Michelle. 
Um, my name is Tyler James. I am a postdoctoral research fellow here in the Department of Family Medicine. Um, I'm jointly appointed in the Center for Disability Health and Wellness, in addition to the Mixed Methods Program. As part of a visual description, I am a white man with short brown hair, clear framed glasses. I'm currently in a home office with a bookshelf behind me. Um, and today I'm going to be discussing emergency department communication experiences of deaf American Sign Language users. Um, just as a point of acknowledgement and disclosure, uh, funding for this project was funded by the uh, Society for Public Health Education through their student fellowship and patient engagement. And I definitely couldn't have been able to do this type of work without the support of community partners, including the Florida Association of the Deaf and the North Central Florida Signing Alliance. And these data have uh, recently been accepted for publication in qualitative health research. Um, I'm really happy because we had an excellent authorship team made up of deaf and hard of hearing researchers, deaf and hard of hearing community members, interpreters, and non-deaf and hard of hearing researchers. As some of you may be aware, emergency room use um, nationwide is increasing at a rate that's faster than the U.S. population growth. Um, and we see especially increased ED utilization in rural populations, low-income communities, and among older adults. Um, and that's important for a few health equity reasons. Uh, the first being that hospital closures um, occur primarily in rural populations and in low income urban communities, uh, particularly racially segregated communities. And um, in fact, in 2019, uh, the was the worst year of the hospital closure crisis for rural communities, uh, with 19 of the 121 hospitals that have closed in the past 10 years closing in that year alone. Having increased emergency department use uh, with fewer hospitals and fewer emergency departments leads to a phenomenon known as ED crowding. And this um, not only burdens emergency department staff members and providers, which leads to breakdown in patient-centered care, it also compromises the six domains of patient safety and quality, increasing patient length of stay, which then again increases crowding, um, in addition to having uh, detrimental effects on patient health outcomes and revenue cycles for hospital systems. Um, and this is particularly important for deaf American Sign Language users because they are more likely to use the emergency department than they are uh, other sources of care, um, and they are also more likely to have emergency department revisit um, than non-deaf and hard of hearing um, English speakers. And so uh, this study focuses on the communication experiences of deaf people whenever they access emergency departments. Whenever deaf people enter the emergency department, uh, there's three main modalities that they could be uh, used to communicate with. Um, the first is written and oral communication. And so this is communicating via spoken language um, and oral modalities or through written communication um, to try to convey information between patient and provider or healthcare staff member um, and patient. And so uh, this is actually a photo from a uh, community activist in the Gainesville, Florida region um, that was taken during their time in the emergency department in Gainesville. Um, and um, if you're not able to tell, this is actually a napkin that's written, like that is written on. So like one of those brown napkins that have been pulled over uh, from like a sink dispenser. Um, and I'm pretty sure it says appointment with, but I'm not completely sure. Um, and after this uh, photo was taken, um, after the provider had given this napkin to the deaf patient, they walked away without further communication. Um, so that just shows how ineffective this modality can be. Um, what we would really prefer is on-site interpreted communication, where an on-site professional American Sign Language interpreter um, is provided uh, to facilitate communication between provider and patient. Um, and again, it's really important. This is a qualified person, a professional um, who is well versed in medical terminology um, and medical interpreting. What we see more predominantly, though, is video remote interpreting or VRI. And essentially, I like to call this an iPad on wheels. Um, and so uh, this is where an interpreter that is off site from the hospital system is connecting to the patient via an iPad or a laptop. Um, and this is wrought with technological issues due to Wi-Fi, lack of devices being charged, lack of staff knowing how to use the devices. Um, so just keep this in mind as we move forward. So as a person who conducts community engaged research, I was heavily involved in the Gainesville, Florida deaf community uh, for over five years. Um, at the height of my time, I left after eight years. Uh, but dear, at the time that the study was being conceptualized, uh, I found that deaf and hard of hearing community members were reporting varying levels of accessibility between emergency departments or emergency rooms and the freestanding emergency centers or urgent care 
um, facilities in Gainesville. And in 2017, after having lunch with a deaf friend who has complex medical needs, uh, we went to the emergency room after he felt like he was having a heart attack. And it took eight hours of continual advocacy before an interpreter was provided. Um, it only, however, took five hours before video remote interpreting was provided, but it was not accessible. Um, the staff did not know how to work the machine. The machine wasn't charged. And then once they were able to get it pulled up, they weren't able to get it to connect to an offsite interpreter. And so like a good PhD student, as I was at the time, I looked at the empirical literature to see if this was an experience that was already published and um, discussed highly in the peer reviewed science. Um, and what we found, of course, was that oral and written communication modalities are less effective for communication access with deaf people. Um, providers who have varying levels of comfort providing access to deaf patients don't always provide that access. And we found a major transferability issue, and that's that the Gainesville Deaf and Hard of Hearing communities experience did not align with the peer reviewed literature. Where I did find alignment, however, was in litigation through multiple federal lawsuits on patient civil rights um, occurring uh, within medical systems, primarily emergency departments. And these are just a few screenshots of headlines that were taken throughout the state of Florida over a five year time period. And so most studies that were available, though, focused on uh, areas with large metropolitan areas with, that have a higher supply of interpreters, which did not align closely with the Gainesville, Florida experience. Um, and there was no studies that focused solely on the emergency department context. A lot of it was just healthcare communication in general. And there was a major temporal limitation. That's that it was outdated. No studies um, were post widespread uh, implementation of VRI, which occurred after 2010, and none occurred after the passage of the Affordable Care Act, which provides more uh, experiences and better uh, protections for deaf patients. And so we conducted semi structured interviews with adult deaf ASL users who'd been a patient at any hospital affiliated ER in the past two years. Interviews occurred over about a nine month time period. All interviews were conducted in American Sign Language and later translated into written English for analysis. And we also conducted uh, member check interviews with participants and a key informant, a deaf interpreter in Florida. And as our lens of analysis, we used a critical disability lens um, and a transformative paradigm lens. We interviewed 11 um, deaf patients who had uh, a variety of experiences, uh, the majority identifying as culturally deaf. All of them were deaf before age three, um, and we had a pretty good uh, racial and um, gender um, diversity as well. We developed five themes based off of these data, and I'm only going to share uh, about two or three of them. But the first theme was that requesting communication access was stressful, frustrating, and time consuming. The second was related to the experiences and perspectives of using video remote interpreting. The third was about the expectations, benefits, and potential drawbacks of using on-site interpreters. Written and oral communication providing insufficient information to deaf patients and ED staff and providers lacking that cultural awareness and sensitivity for deaf patients. Here is one quote uh, related to the use of video remote interpreting and how it diminishes patient-centered care. The deaf patient said, they were paying more attention to VRI and I'm like, hello, I'm in the ER. Why are you looking at the machine? And they were trying to figure out the connection and bringing in a technician to fix it. And the nurses were fiddling with it. And it felt like I wasn't even there. I felt like I was being ignored, like the equipment was more important than my health. With respect to the theme on written and oral communication modalities being ineffective, uh, we found that discharge instructions were predominantly inaccessible for deaf patients and that uh, there was not an interpreter available at time of discharge, which uh, prevented deaf patient from uh, being able to effectively manage their conditions after being discharged. They'll give me my prescriptions and just send me on my way without explaining anything about what is going on. There's no communication. I have to wait to see my primary care doctor for them to explain what I'm supposed to do with all of these medications that the ER is giving me. I don't know everything about what's going on with my health. And then lastly, related to ED staff and provider cultural sensitivity um, for deaf patients, uh, we found that uh, there was a lot of prescribing communication access. So a deaf patient indicating that they needed a sign language interpreter, but if they were able to speak for themselves or if they used hearing aids, that providers would attempt to negotiate and deny them this accessibility. They were trying to argue with me thinking that they knew what kind of accommodations I needed, but I told them I needed an interpreter in order to understand everything that was going on. 
And they thought because I was arguing with them that I could hear, but I just had to keep telling them I can't hear. I don't know what's happening. Just because I can speak doesn't mean. And the deaf participant trailed off in silence. And what I would like to um, indicate here is that just because a person can speak does not mean that they do not require the use of American Sign Language Interpreter. And so the key takeaway from this is that deaf patient communication rights are being fundamentally denied in some ED contexts. And this directly impedes the development of effective patient provider relationships, which has direct implications for short and long term patient health outcomes for deaf patients, including limiting opportunities to provide informed consent for treatment and procedures and engage in shared decision making, uh, leading to potential ED discharge failure and revisit and that the fact that decreased communication access maintains low health literacy for this patient population. Thank you all. And unfortunately, we do not have time for questions, so please bring those to the breakout room or uh, text Tyler directly. Um, our next presentation is later life incidents of mobility limitations among older adults, impact on path control, performance, and intervention. Hi everyone, my name is Cam Gamonatabatanon. I am a PhD candidate at the Center for Ergonomics under the Department of um, Industrial and Operations Engineering. I am a Southeast Asian woman wearing black glasses, I have long dark hair. I am in a uh, red and yellow or red jacket and um, over a yellow t-shirt. My background is blurred, but I am in an office. Um, I will be sharing today our preliminary work titled Later Life Incidents of Mobility Limitations Among Older Adults and the Impact on Path Control Performance and Intervention. I'm very happy to be here today. I've been working um, in research related to designing for inclusion and accessibility since the start of my graduate career um, back at Oregon State. And this particular project integrates motor control theory and human factors engineering uh, towards the goal of improving inclusive mobility within built environments. Um, the integration of these theories uh, for a quick interjunction um, focuses on the motor control loop um, for mobility, beginning with our top-down sensory perception and our initial execution of a motor command. We then perceive our executed actions in sensory motor perception and then adjust our movement in a bottom-up feedback loop. And this loop indicates that our effective movements are dependent on our perceptions of the environment affordances and also our actions within a space. So this particular project will specifically attempt to leverage our sensory motor perception as a means of helping to improve mobility. Um, as many of you are aware, there is a growing concern for mobility as a facet of healthy and successful aging. Um, and I want to take a quick look as to where this concerns, concern stems from. Um, to start, back um, in uh, 20, 2035, the U.S. Census um, estimates that the older adult population can be as high as 21% of the population. And of concern, we see that this generation, as they approach old age, also exhibits a greater prevalence of disability compared to previous generations. Most commonly, this is related to mobility. Um, they've also shown an increased desire to uh, remain mobile and active in their current communities. And we see a decrease in stigma and barriers related to access to mobility age, which is great because um, these factors contribute to an expected increase in mobility aid usage. However, um, access to these aids do not necessarily uh, guarantee that these uh, older adults will have successful support as 44% of older adults are not as independently mobile as they desire, even with their mobility aid. And this can lead to high levels of dependency, a higher level of a sedentary lifestyle than desired and reduced quality of life overall. So to address this problem, it's crucial to develop support systems for independent mobility uh, among older adults and address any barriers to independent mobility. Now, barriers and challenges are not a direct result of a health condition or old age. It's rather the result of a capability demand mismatch between the person within their context. And these mismatches can occur for a number of reasons. Um, for example, accessibility standards uh, can be insufficient with our rapidly changing population and the growing range of assistive needs and devices that people require. Um, and these mismatches, in addition to personal characteristics, for example, recent incidents that can lead to a cycle of um, limited participation, reduced use of skill, increased isolation, and therefore reduced confidence. Um, and this can perpetuate a loop of reduced mobility. So it's very important to mitigate these barriers now and prevent the growing number of older adults from being caught in this loop um, in the future with the gray wave. Um, it's especially important um, to look at the intersection between older adults and disability because these individuals are likely to be greatly disadvantaged by society as it currently stands. 
So the focus of this project um, will be to focus on those with recent incidents of limitations, since there is limited knowledge um, on the needs and preference differences between those who age into disability versus those who age with disability. Um, there is literature available related to um, expected differences, which can be framed within the WHO's ICF framework. Um, for example, aging into a disability um, can lead to reduced sense of community and greater isolation. And also lift, different lived experiences will lead to different learned motor skills and capabilities. But there is limited work available um, to direct action for proactive interventions. Um, research in this area has also been limited. Um, since many studies divide groupings based on health condition or age groups, um, and there's limited assessments on older adults with long-term disabilities and the resulting differences on the effective task performance across these two incidence ages. Now, we believe that filling this knowledge gap is key because it can inform the ways in which older adults who age into disability require support, um, as we expect that these will be different from how those with long-term disability require support. Hence, the research goal of this project um, is to mitigate the capability demand mismatches via environmental interventions to leverage sensory motor perception of a navigation space towards supporting the development of motor programs and skills in older adults with later in life instance of mobility limitations. Now we propose environmental interventions um, in order to attempt to overcome short-term limitations and inequitable implementation um, that can happen with person-based interventions like training. We focus on recruiting by functional capability, not by a health condition. Um, so the scope of our work would be limited to uh, adults um, greater than 50 years of age. And we control for mobility limitation by manual wheelchair usage. Um, so to capture the needs of older adults along a spectrum of limitations, we recruit um, those who either have full or need manual wheelchair, sorry, for either full or partial support and who are either fully independent or need some assistance in their usage. We did have to limit um, on other functional limitations and recruitment specifically for significant visual and cognitive limitations and upper extremity loss. Um, manual wheelchairs uh, were selected to control for which functional abilities we can examine in the study um, because studies have found that older adults experience a great deal of difficulty with this type of mobility aid, um, despite it being um, the most accessible in terms of the wheeled mobility devices. Um, one study finding as high as 61% of older adult veterans reporting difficulty in use. Um, our key outcomes are divided into the categories of usability as defined by the ISO. And it's hoped that the outcome of this work can fill a knowledge gap in this field and inform user definitions for universal design processes in order to support the proactive creation of environments um, that can improve the confidence in mobility. This goal is assessed in three aims. The first aim has been completed and I'll be presenting some results on this, um, was to identify uh, individual and environmental factors that impact assumed performance. We did this via online and mail survey. The second aim is currently ongoing. It's a lab experimental study designed to understand uh, discrepancies between the effective versus the perceived performance, uh, both within and between instance age groups. And the final aim, um, is to apply or develop and apply environmental interventions based on AIM2 results and to evaluate that effect on the performance and performance discrepancy. Interventions, um, the goal is to have interventions target the pain points that were observed in the second AIM um, with some broad examples, including increased line of sight um, or pro providing observable areas for endurance support. I'd like to use the rest of my time to present some key findings from the survey um, and in details about the ongoing experimental study. So the survey findings supported group differences between the older adults who use wheelchairs with earlier versus later in life incidents. Um, we used a cutoff age of 45 years at incidents um, to divide these two groups. A total of 38 participants were recruited and participated in the survey, approximately two thirds of which reported later in life incidents of manual wheelchair usage. And the mean age in either group was roughly the same, about 62 years. And the proportion of biological male and female in either group was also roughly the same, also about two thirds female. Um, the results on the left uh, show that across the nine maneuvering tasks that were accessed, um, the, lower, the lower performance was assumed by the later in life group with comments alluding to greater difficulty and frustration for all these tasks. Statistical significance was not assessed for all categories of maneuvering um, as indicated, 
but we do note that the trend is consistent in each category of task. And we also note importantly that each group seemed to struggle the most with a different aspect of the environment and task. The results on the right show that as the maneuvering task became more complex, um, note this is a complexity and not more, more serial tasks, um, the assumed performance did not constantly decrease. Um, the complexity value of four uh, represented a parallel park task that required four base maneuvers. Um, and it had a higher assumed performance than a linear trend would predict. And the complexity value of three um, was the addition of a backwards maneuver in addition to the value of two. And this result should, suggests that it might be possible to support a base maneuver in mobility as a means of improving performance for more complex and potentially more serial tasks. Um, our survey also showed that while both groups, um, the earlier in life and the later in life incidence group, reported using their wheelchair for a similar frequency and range of tasks, um, for example, moving indoors around furniture um, or at the store, the later in life group um, reported less independent usage, but also curiously reported a comparable um, frequency of assisted usage compared to the earlier in life group. This along with some uh, open-ended comments suggests that it might be possible that the later in life group experiences barriers to usage, specifically barriers to assistance, uh, more so than their counterparts. Um, so such comments, for example, are rolling around is difficult, so my daughter takes me out. I am nearly never alone or I only use a wheelchair when someone is able to push me. Um, additional questions for a more mixed methods design might be useful in future phases to really parse out um, where these barriers are coming from for this group. Results also indicated um, lower self-efficacy consistently reported for daily tasks by the later in life group, and much lower self-efficacy was reported for carpet usage, um, which suggests a potential strength or different balance. Um, and this is supported by the expected differences we um, mentioned um, from the differing uh, motor capability buildup um, between the two groups. Um, I'd like to highlight some key uh, methods and measures uh, from our current work. Um, <clears throat> so in order to assess the aim and understand these differences. And sorry. just so you know, you just one minute left. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so we follow this concept map where we're interested in not only the subjective but the effective performance um, individually, but also to understand the, the differences between this because we want to use this to identify how perception can be supported in order to improve the motor command loop. Um, I'd like to jump to the summary slide. So to briefly summarize <laughs> everything I just <laughs> said at you, um, we applied the motor control theory and a human factors principles to develop environmental interventions with the goal of um, supporting the improvement of a proactive um, means of getting more accessibility. And preliminary results support that the later in life group experienced different mismatches within the same environment and during the same task. Um, I wanna emphasize our hypothesis um, that uh, we hypothesize that through the mitigation of the perceived and effective performance discrepancies with that sensory motor perception, we can support the development of an accurate internal motor program and help support performance, most notably for older adults who age into disability. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our funding sources, um, the Center for Occupational Health Safety Engineering, as well as the Rackham Graduate School. And I'm sorry, I'm running over, but- And, thank and you I need, we need to actually move on so people can see of course. this and we got to move forward. So I thank you very much, there. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Erickson. Excellent. So, hi, my name is Steve Erickson. I'm an associate professor here at the University of Michigan at the College of Pharmacy. And I'll be speaking on a, a, a series of projects, or actually a program of work I've been doing for the last decade. And it's around comprehensive medication reviews for persons with intellectual or developmental disabilities um, here at our health system known as Michigan Medicine. Uh, the objective of, the, of my talk today would be present evidence supporting the development of this interprofessional practice experience around comprehensive medication reviews for adults with IDD who are patients of Michigan Medicine. So first of all, some definitions. Um, there's, a, uh, let me also take a step back. I jumped right into it. But I am a older white male. Let me describe myself. I'm an older white male with grain short hair. I'm wearing a white shirt with some blue pinstripes. I have glasses. I have a headset on just to help my hearing. And I'm sitting at my office at the College of Pharmacy. 
All right. So as far as definitions go, we're uh, I've listed here the developmental and intellectual disability definitions that are commonly accepted, but we're going to be mainly talking about adults who have conditions such as Down syndrome, uh, cerebral palsy, Williams syndrome, um, and uh, what's called intellectual disability of uh, undetermined cause. Um, but usually these are conditions which are lifelong. They develop before the age of 22 and leads to uh, and is associated with uh, functional limitations or um, limitations in intellectual functioning and develop uh, adaptive behavior. Now, when we talk about medications, first of all, we wanna know what sort of chronic illnesses do people have? Because chronic illness in our health systems mean medications. That's how one of the tools we use uh, to treat our chronic illnesses. And for generally speaking, folks with intellectual and developmental disability, now, by the way, I'm going to use the abbreviation IDD. So folks with IDD as adults have very similar prevalence of chronic illness to the general population. Um, but a few others are found more often. And a list I have here is what from patients within Michigan Medicine in a study we did. Um, certainly mental health, anxiety, and depression is seen more often, hypothyroidism, obesity, and on the flip side, weight loss, paralysis, and spasticity, seizure disorder. And from the literature, we also find that cardiovascular disease, heart failure, diabetes, stroke, are also more commonly seen in the population. I list challenging behavior here because this is what's off, it's often documented for folks with IDD. You don't see it in the general population documented under the diagnostic list, but we do know people have challenging behaviors in the general population. It just seems that folks with IDD, this is often a diagnostic code that we find in, in, in the list of medications. But nonetheless, challenging behavior is has been acknowledged as uh, uh, being uh, a, a, a sort of a, an issue in folks with I, some folks with IDD. When we talk about medications, it's important to realize the medication management system that is in place in general, uh, then also that folks with IDD who use medications uh, utilize. So for example, in a typical family home where most adults, about 70% of adults with IDD live in the community with family or friends, um, it's typically the community pharmacy where patients will go. If a person lives in a supported living environment, such as a group home or a supported uh, apartment, which by the way, our oldest son, Christopher, who has Down syndrome, just moved out six weeks ago into a wonderful supported environment in which he is very happy, much more so I think than he was with mom and dad. Um, but uh, anyway, he lives in a supported environment where, where there's staff 24 seven to assist in his daily needs and community-based activities. When we look at the administra medication administration processes in the supported living environments, it's much more prescribed, very similar to the process that you would see in a nursing home or in a hospital where there's documentation of, of, of doses and oversight of the med, uh, med process, assisting the individual in either um, supported self-medication or administering the medications to the resident. Now, the medication-related problems that are seen in general, but may be more common in folks with IDD, include polypharmacy with potential drug interactions, duplication of therapy, especially psychotropic medications, inadequate monitoring, complex regimens, reliance on caregivers with head to, who have various uh, levels of competency. We'll show that in a minute. Uh, communication problems are a key issue. Physical dexterity of self-managing their medications, being able to open the containers, for example, hearing and visual impairment, health literacy and literacy, and one uh, problem called diagnostic overshadowing. This is just where a healthcare provider will ascribe a problem that, that's identified uh, to be related to the IDD condition rather than the actual medical condition. Classic example, an ingrown toenail for a, an adult who's minimally uh, communicative um, and who may be exhibiting what's kind of commonly known as challenging behaviors um, may end up being prescribed an antipsychotic rather than looking at the foot, which is causing the, the pain and the challenging behavior. That's an example of diagnostic overshadowing. So to a, 
hopefully you get a little bit of an idea of, of this, the, the environment in which a person uh, with IDD and the managing their medications and the, the medical related issues. Um, when I embarked on this work about 10 years ago, I was at, uh, so on sabbatical at the Developmental Disability Institute at Wayne State. And one of the first things I did was look at the literature to see what are the med related problems. And basically I found very little. So I did a conducted focus groups around the state of Michigan, five different sites with uh, support staff, uh, uh, patients with IDD or people with IDD and uh, family. And basically we found some um, common problems and these are the themes we found that prescribers didn't understand policies around insurance and other things leading to lacks and gaps in therapy, continuity of care, um, accuracy of med records and clinical records, poor communication between uh, the dyad of the caregiver, the patient, and the prescriber, uh, patient willingness to take medicine as it can be a problem, caregiver understanding and training of medication-related issues, that's actually a big problem, and health system being on prepared to work with people with IDD. Comes from lack of training and a lack of system that understands the needs of the individual. Now, I embarked on a series of studies here at Michigan Medicine to, to document what are the issues in our backyard. One is polypharmacy. This is consistent with the literature, and we find that adults with IDD match to an age and gender matched group of folks without I, IDD in our pop, general primary care clinics, we find polypharmacy. We also find complex medication regimens using a standardized instrument called the uh, Medication Regimen Complexity Index, which is used in geriatric research. We find that the adult with IDD has a very complex medication regimen on average, much more so than the general population, and on par with studies that have demonstrated hospitalizations and ER visits for med-related problems. We also Dr. find that literally- Yes. About three minutes left. Okay, very good. We also find health literacy is an issue, uh, not only with the patient, but also the caregiver. We find that caregivers are stressed about managing medications, as we found from the Hassel scale. We also found that with disease state management, such as asthma, we find that caregivers have lack of understanding of an asthma and its treatment, which leads to adverse uh, outcomes. We found in a study looking at um, uh, US level data that hospitalizations for adverse medication events occur much more often in IDD than the general population. And we also found that people with IDD that have heart failure or heart disease, they're not prescribed guideline-based therapy at the same level as folks without IDD. So in summary, um, there's pharmacists can have an impact. Uh, there are three literature reviews that identified limited day, uh, data on this. And for example, it's mainly in institutionalized patients and around psychiatry. I conducted a study a few years ago with a pilot study looking at in-home comprehensive medication reviews where we found an average of two and a half medication related problems, which led to three immediate phone calls to, to rectify problems. So realizing that yes, there are problems that are identified primarily from in-home medication reviews, something you can't find in a clinic, for example. So our next steps are this. We wanna create an interprofessional practice here. I've talked to Dr. McKee about this. Um, we've submitted a grant on this where we do in-home reviews. We have learners with students from all health disciplines and residents to interact around this uh, opportunity. I'm gonna continue our health and dis disabilities interprofessional course. And I've is also submitted an R18, which will be reviewed this month at AHRQ to do in-home reviews for a thousand residents of Wayne County. So in the end, health professionals need to be aware of their obligation to ensure safe and effective medication use for people with disabilities. That's my son, Chris, giving you a thumbs up that we need to take care of folks and ensure that they're safe with the use of their medicines. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to hold the questions um, because I know we have a lot of uh, the next speaker also has time limitations. Um, but, uh, Mark, uh, you were going to be talking on growing up with cerebral palsy. So my name is Mark Peterson. Uh, I'm on faculty here in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehab. Um, uh, as a description, I'm a middle-aged white male uh, with spiked up blonde hair. 
and uh, a black polo shirt on. So today I'll talk about briefly about our work re related to adult uh, outcomes with cerebral palsy. So for those of you in the audience that don't know, cerebral palsy is the most common pediatric onset physical disability with an estimated prevalence around three per thousand uh, live births in the United States. Uh, many individuals with CP uh, can expect normal life expectancies, and yet there's total lack of clinical follow-up for patients after they transition from pediatric to adult primary care. And, and obviously, very insufficient cohort data to track patients with CP longitudinally as they age. Um, however, there are uh, very numerous accounts from especially clinical colleagues um, to describe adults with CP um, that, that, that can span various things like accelerated aging, some of the jargon that we hear are premature frailty, um, they have normal weight obesity, um, and, and we know that they are uh, very sedentary. And so the model of work that I, that I have studied over the course of the last 10 years or so is uh, what happens to children as they grow up with CP, and from the context of how does obesity and aging affect chronic disease. And so given the documented uh, losses of muscle mass and bone mass and increases in visceral adiposity that we know to happen um, in, in all adults, but especially adults um, with CP who are very sedentary, um, is there an increased risk for chronic diseases? And we, um, our group was the first group to look at health outcomes from the standpoint of non-communicable diseases and cerebral palsy. And we uh, found, and so I'm trying to advance my slides, here we go. We found that across uh, multiple organ systems um, that there was an increased risk on the order of two to five fold increased risk across um, diabetes, asthma, hypertension, heart, heart disease, stroke, emphysema, uh, and less surprisingly, joint pain and arthritis. And so this for, for the first time ever, we, we showed that essentially there are um, issues related to preventable chronic diseases and cerebral palsy, especially as they age. Um, Dr. Dan Whitney, uh, who's in our department, who has done a tremendous amount of work in, in, in his uh, short career here at U of M, did a study a, a couple of years ago looking at non-communicable diseases in, in young adults with cerebral palsy here at the University of Michigan. And we were able to pull data from electronic medical records um, among a very large cohort of young adults, 18 to 30 years of age, to look at uh, early on, basically early onset diseases that we would consider to be related to aging um, in the general population. And what we found was that for folks with cerebral palsy, um, there was not only higher risk for chronic diseases across multiple organ systems, but they had much higher prevalence of multimorbidity. And so the bar graph basically shows um, zero being healthy, no chronic diseases, one being uh, one, and then as you can see, two, three, four or more chronic diseases. And so adults with cerebral palsy and then adults who were non-ambulatory had much higher risk um, of, having, of having multiple chronic co-occurring uh, conditions. Um, we've since published a huge amount of <laughs> research on health outcomes, physical health outcomes, specifically in, in adults aging with CP. Um, I'm not going to be able to go into any depth in any of these, but essentially what we have found is that there's increased risk factors um, uh, for many preventable chronic uh, diseases across multiple organ systems. The, 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 the good news here is that even though that sounds, um, that sounds scary and that sounds depressing, is that these are very preventable with uh, lifestyle interventions, early interventions, early screening um, to identify risk factors um, across multiple organ systems. And so growing up with CP doesn't have to be um, all negative. It can definitely be prevented with physical activity, sleep interventions, um, and especially early screening and, and risk stratification. Um, so to date, there have been um, very few studies published prior to 2000, basically 2007, 2008, related to adults with cerebral palsy. Um, I put this landscape of literature up so that you can see sort of the first study ever published in 1953 that had anything to do with adults with CP. And then as of today, I looked just this morning before I jumped on, um, in 2021, there have been so far, that number is outdated. I, I put this in probably a few months ago. It's now 67 papers published related to adults with CP in the year 2021. And so there is an, a very, very nice uptick of information coming from, from research. 
around the world uh, related to the needs, health needs, um, and health care needs and health disparities facing adults with cerebral palsy. So this to me is heartening because we know that that is uh, important and certainly um, even though CP has been traditionally considered a pediatric condition, uh, there are certainly more adults living with CP than there are children. So some of the research uh, questions and clinical vignettes that are still outstanding is, is there increased risk for mental health disorders? We have gotten bombarded with questions from parents and patients themselves and even caregivers uh, that are not parents uh, about health outcomes related to mental health. And so we are, I'll, I'll highlight a few studies related to the most recent stuff that we've published um, in our group. And so recently we did a large database claims um, research study um, using ICD-10 codes to identify adults with CP who had private insurance. And um, we also considered intellectual disabilities, autism spectrum disorders, and epilepsy as a covariate. And you can see we looked across 37 mental health disorders uh, in a fairly large cohort of CP of just over 7,000. And again, Dan Whitney is the lead author on this paper, uh, tremendous uh, publication, Annals of Internal Medicine, found that adults with CP uh, had higher risk factors across all categories uh, for mental health outcomes than adults without CP. And adults with CP who had co-occurring co neurodevelopmental disabilities um, had an even higher risk. And so Certainly, this is, 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 is really interesting and preliminary information to suggest that we need to be thinking about mental health outcomes, psychiatric health outcomes, and care for folks living with CP. Um, I then followed up with, a, with another longitudinal study looking at claims in adults with cerebral palsy and spina bifida. And we essentially found the same thing, that adults living with CP and spina bifida had a higher risk for uh, essentially all psychiatric disorders across all categories. And even after adjusting, including centralized pain, and even after uh, including pretty much everything you can adjust for in a model, um, adults with CP and spina bifida had a really high and robust risk for developing um, uh, incident psychiatric disorders in their claim. So I only have a few minutes left. Uh, one thing that is a hallmark of CP is pain. Um, and we are interested in not only understanding sort of the mechanism of pain and CP, but also how it affects health outcomes in, in our population. And um, so Dan, again, did a study that looked at pain and mood affective disorders in adults living with CP and found essentially that folks who have with CP who have uh, new and consistent pain um, have a significantly higher risk for developing mood affective disorders um, uh, than, than folks without folks with CP without uh, persistent, uh, new or persistent pain. And so pain obviously contributes to mental health outcomes in the non-CP population. And it's a very important contributing factor, but because pain is such a, is such a major hallmark issue in CP, it's something that we should be considering um, in the context of mental health. Um, and then lastly, uh, the last thing I'll talk about today is we just finished a pain phenotyping study in, in our clinical cohort of adults with CP here at Michigan. And you know, used survey data from 71 adults uh, being seen here at the University of Michigan Health System. Um, we categorized pain on the basis of three sort of taxonomy of pain of three different types, nociplastic pain, which is considered to be centralized pain. Um, we assessed using fibromyalgia survey. Um, pain severity, sort of the intensity of pain with the brief pain inventory, and then neuropathic pain with the pain detect score. Um, and what we found was that adults living with CP had an extremely high risk for um, both neuroplastic, no nociplastic and neuropathic pain, as well as combined. Um, you can see that's kind of represented in the yellow, green, and orange. Um, and then the blue is essentially everything else, which is considered to be a peripheral pain um, nociceptive pain stemming from joint and muscle. And so very high prevalence, obviously, of pain in CP, but the mechanism is, is somewhat, um, it, it, it has been less understood what the mechanism of, of centralized pain uh, in that population is. So uh, basically what we also showed, which was interesting, is that scoring positive for nociplastic centralized pain was significantly a predictor of depression and anxiety in, in our adults with CP. And um, although nociceptive pain or peripheral pain is common, pain arising from neuropathic and nociplastic mechanisms seems to correlate with poor 
health-related quality of life outcomes um, compared to pain that arises simply from musculoskeletal system, which is what most people who are studying pain and CP have been studying kind of all along. So we need to be thinking about the mechanism of pain. And if it is arising from the central nervous system, there is definitely different treatment patterns um, and needs for, for addressing that. So we have ongoing, a lot of ongoing work um, in terms of long-term consequences of pain treatment. Um, opioid obviously is a major issue um, in the general population, but it's much worse actually in the CP population. Um, we have some new studies looking at that. Um, preventive screening, health disparities in preventive screening and cancer, hypogonadism uh, in men with CP. Um, so that, that seems to be an issue which could be related to sarcopenia and weakness. Uh, and then obviously health healthcare disparities across the lifespan, um, which would lead to um, poor health uh, healthcare coordination, which we're trying to address through various mechanisms and avenues, including telehealth, um, and for physical and especially behavior and mental health. Um, so we need better infrastructure, more clinical providers, and certainly better policy to make sure that that can happen at some point. That was fast, and I'm sorry for that, but please feel free to email me. I'm happy to send you any materials, papers, anything. So um, I don't think we have time for questions, but I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, Dr. Peterson, for your overview of the interesting research that you're doing on this important issue. Thank you very much for inviting me to join you guys. Welcome, or welcome back to the, um, the University of Michigan Second Annual Disability Research Symposium. Already this morning, we've had a wealth of wonderful presenters, starting off with the, our keynote, uh, the Nidler Director, Dr. Anjali Forber-Pratt, um, who was talk, talk to us about the importance of representation and disability identity and the efforts by the federal government to ensure enhanced inclusion of this, these groups. Um, now we're gonna, uh, we also heard about the issues experienced by many individuals with um, disabilities and how it's been articulated in the research. This afternoon, we will be talking about Steps, people, uh, steps that are being taken to transform healthcare systems. My name is Dr. Michelle Mead. I am the co-director for the U of M Center for Disability Health and Wellness, a professor in the departments of physical medicine and rehabilitation um, and a rehabilitation psychology and disability advocate here at the University of Michigan. I am a middle-aged white female with uh, graying brown hair, freckles and glasses. I am currently sitting in my office, but I have a Zoom background on with the, uh, a scene from outdoors at Michigan Medicine and the Block M. 61 million Americans, or maybe 61.4 million Americans, that's the number of individuals in the United States having a disability. One in four individuals. These individuals experience disparities in their health as compared with those without. They have higher rates of early death, suicide, hospitalizations, sedentary behaviors, smoking, preventable chronic conditions, oral diseases, executive functioning, and health illiteracy and they are more likely to undergo severe medical complications, to report fair or poor health status, to experience social isolation, depression, and anxiety, to say they, they have insufficient emotional support, and to identify risk factors for substance abuse 
and domestic violence. Despite that, these individuals are also less likely to use medical services associated with preventative care and health maintenance, to be able to access routine dental care, to be able to have access or receive counseling around issues of alcohol and substance abuse or treatment for mental illnesses. And they're more likely to report unmet head care needs, cost barriers, times where they have been unable to access care for multiple reasons. Encounters characterized by being not respected or not listened to. And finally, dissatisfaction with their healthcare um, encounters. The past year has been particularly hard for individuals with disability as related to life in general and also access to health and healthcare. They experience greater risk for poor health outcomes, increased risk of death, from COVID-19 with individuals with IDD having a six times higher rate of death than those in the general population. They experienced reduced access to routine health services and care, and also increased risk of having life-saving services denied or removed. They have a lack of appropriate data collection as has been articulated. We many places do not even identify individuals with disabilities or disability status as they collect information about COVID transmissions or cases. They have accessibility barriers related to information, testing, and vaccination. They have higher rates of adverse social outcomes, including social isolation and depression, greater likelihood of unemployment, and increased difficulty in finding and retaining healthcare providers. Moreover, these issues are compounded for individuals with disabilities from marginalized communities. Women, individuals who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color, people living in poverty, children, LGBTQ, and individuals who are marginalized based on their geography and access to resources. Here at Michigan Medicine, we consider ourselves the leaders and the best. In 2020, we had over 2.6 million outpatient clinic visits, over 46,000 hospital discharges, about 95,000 emergency department visits, 67,000 surgeries, and about 5,000 deliveries. That means if one in four individuals with disabilities or in Michigan, one in three, that at a minimum, we would expect to have individuals with disabilities interacting here at Michigan Medicine as patients in over 661,000 of those outpatient clinic visits, over 11,000 of those hospital discharges, over six. 15,000, almost 17,000 of those emergency department visits, 23,000 of those service surgeries, and over 1,000 of those deliveries. This is likely an underestimate, however, as we know individuals with disabilities may be more likely to require hospitalizations because of those previous mentioned health outcomes, disparities in outcomes, um, and the increased need for disorder services. So given the number of patients with disabilities we see here and the healthcare disparities that exist, what can we do and what we are we doing to transform healthcare? As we have, have and will, as our presenters have and will tell us, we can increase in awareness. Multiple presentations have already talked about the importance of being aware not only of the issues and the healthcare ex disparities experienced by individuals with disabilities, but those that exist at the intersections of issues or of identities of disability, race, and other statuses. 
we can consciously create environments that facilitate positive outcomes, that enhance communications, that are set up to provide accessibility and accommodations for individuals with disabilities. We can educate providers over and over again. We hear how individuals um, in focus groups and interviews talk about the need for their providers to know about how to communicate with them, to know about cultural competency issues, to know how to work with individuals with disabilities. We can support families and social networks. These are critical supports in, for individuals with disabilities and especially strong from individuals from Black and African American and other racial and ethnic minority communities. They provide a sense of understanding. They provide practical assistance. Uh, and we need to figure out how to include them in the conversations and in our solutions. We optimize the attitudes of all stakeholders. As we'll hear in a, a little bit from presenter Lisa Reber, it's all about people's attitudes and that attitudinal environment provides the will to keep moving forward. We gather data appropriately. We need to know not just one of individuals, a part of individuals identity and story, but all of it. So we know about what their skills and experiences are. We need to ask, do you have an accommodation? For, do you have a disability for which you need an accommodation? And then we have to do something about it. The, we heard about the importance um, by, in the presentation by uh, Dr. James, and we'll hear more about the efforts going on here at Michigan Medicine related to this from Dr. McKee. We need to screen for functional deficits. We can't just assume. Many people try to bluff or they may not be aware of some of the issues and impairments that they experience. Screening allows us to adapt our care. And then we need to do that. We need to adapt and tailor the care that we provide to everyone, but particularly to individuals with disabilities to make sure that it is relevant to our patients. We need to create technology and we're excited to be able to hear from presenters who will talk about the technology that they have created to enhance functioning and access for individuals with disabilities. We need to translate, implement and integrate the relevant knowledge and research into clinical practice. We need to review, update and advocate for policies to enhance outcomes, or we need to create these ourselves. Moreover, we can and we are facilitating the inclusion of healthcare providers and researchers with disabilities as important components of our teams. We are engaging and partnering with communities. This is critical to both understand and to work to create sustainable solutions together. And we're collaborating. We can't do it all ourselves. One discipline does not have all the answers. The more we can reach out and support, know about what each other is doing, we can bring ourselves up. We can help make everything better, help find solutions. In summary, to transform health care and healthcare systems, we have to keep opening our eyes, engaging hearts and minds, facilitating discussions, developing partnerships and collaborations, empowering both patients and providers by providing information, skills, and resources. We have to create disability-specific, disability-informed research projects and tailored interventions and implement those findings to create sustainable solutions. And we have to advocate for relevant policies. Healthcare disparities are about us. Addressing and eliminating them are our responsibility. It is for that reason I am so excited to, from the discussions and presentations this morning, the recommendations that were provided and our continued presenters this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mead. Let's go ahead, proceed with our next presenter. 
Awesome. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Samir Rawashte. Uh, as a quick description, I'm a, a mid-30s uh, Caucasian male, black hair, wearing a white shirt. Um, so our project, we call our project Rehab Buddy, right? So it, 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 it helps you do physical therapy and rehab. So uh, our the title is Rehab Buddy Extending Individualized Physical Thera Physical Rehabilitation Beyond the Clinic Using Wearable Motion Sensors. So we're looking at using wearable technology to assist people doing their physical therapy. It's a collaborative project between myself and the kind of, and on the engineering side and a collaborator, Dr. Tim Uhl at the University of Kentucky, um, who's a physical therapist. Um, the project is funded by the National Science Foundation. So here is a... Uh, kind of the, the overall snapshot. Um, so muscle, musculoskeletal conditions affect uh, very many Americans, one third of the US population annually. Uh, the current standard of care is uh, is reliant on patient self-reporting, right? So you um, like to do your exercises and it, you know, you can't really tell. So we, were look, we kind of would like to develop a system to give us an objective measure. Uh, with the risk of re-injury because of proper um, improper exercise execution and uh, the significant non-compliance. So those are our motivations to develop something like this. And looking at the figure here, we don't want to replace the physical therapist. Instead, we want to extend their reach to the home. So we developed an app and with the robo motion sensors that in the clinic, the, the, the physical therapists and the patient can together define exercises depending on the, on the patient's condition, right? And, and it's very highly individualized. That's kind of one of our main uh, kind of angles to this project, where you can define any exercise at the from any start pose to any target pose, and then have the patient repeat those. Whereas other systems, you know, uh, from an engineering perspective, they're kind of hard coded for certain exercises, and you have to pick from a menu. And ours, you can just define any exercise. And then when you're home, um, it, the system assists you and reproducing those same movements. So the full range of motion, the correct number of repetitions, and while staying on the plane of motion. Um, so the, the way we're doing it is um, we're using inertial measurement units. So they're very common sensors and like little toy drones and uh, or they're even in our cell phones and our tablets. Um, and the core measurement we're getting is the, the, the pose, right? With the orientation of, of that sensor. Um, this is actually a senior design project from uh, five, six years ago now, where the, the student here is wearing two of these IMUs, and you can kind of see how we're able to capture the, the body motion. So that's the core measurement. And it's not just a single number, right, number of degrees, but it's actually a three degree of freedom measurement. So it's, you know, in aerospace, we would say roll, pitch, and yaw, right? So we would have like three dimensional rotation in space that we're capturing. Um, so how do we, how does the system work? So we, we ask the patient to go into the start pose. Uh, we tag that. And then they go to the target pose, we tag that. And now we have a, a defined exercise arc. And then um, in the feedback, uh, when it's time to do the exercise, we have those three measurements now. We have the start and target and then the current, right? And it kind of forms a triangle that tells us how far they're progressing towards the target pose. And if they're off plane, we can kind of sense that too, right? If they're moving, if they're compensating, or they're not doing exercise correctly, we can sense that and give them some feedback. You'll see the you see a bunch of cues here. Those are quaternions. Um, it's basically a term for it's one way to represent pose, right? So that's how we define our pose. So this is what the tablet app looks like. Um, um, the main kind of view here is this trapezoid, where in blue is the actual the patient's movement. So. The, you know, it starts over here at the start pose, and then the, the patient goes up to the target pose. It makes sure they reach the full, uh, full range of motion, and it starts progressing. Um, and it makes sure they hold a certain amount of time, and then they come back down. Um, this other bar error bar here shows a plane of motion error. And uh, here's my student uh, Ella, who just defended her master's thesis on this, uh, demonstrating the system. So here's a sensor, uh, worn. Right now, just taped, but uh, to kind of to see it more clearly. But there's like straps that we can use. So the the the, the start pose was defined. Now the click to define the target pose, and then going on to the next screen, the system will coach her to go between those two poses a certain number of times. But um, what Ella will do here is she'll actually intentionally drop her arm, and then this error bar will 
will go crazy, right? And it'll kind of force her to stay on track and, and do the exercise correctly. We, uh, we've tried this ourselves on ourselves. So not, this is not, this is with healthy people. It's, it's actually Ella wearing the sensors. With and without feedback, we notice a difference in, uh, in overextension. So without feedback, you're more likely to overextend. And also you're less like, you're, you won't hold as long. Right, so people are in a hurry and they'll drop their arm too soon, whereas you want the three second hold, for example. And arm abduction is like a single plane of motion movement. We also tried it on, you know, try to flex and see how well we can track three degree of freedom motion. So this is a, for a diagonal motion, like drawing a sword is kind of how my PT collaborator described it. And so we did that and we can kind of similarly, you're more likely to overextend without feedback. You're not holding as long, you're four seconds on average whereas this, the whole time should have been more closer to six. Um, so we just uh, tried it on ourselves. The math makes sense and it looked good. And then we have some clinical trials ongoing. We have 30 subjects so far. And we see that here too. So this is ROM for range of motion. With the rehab body feedback, you can kind of see the distribution here. People aren't overextending and we we're pretty close to 100%. Without feedback, you're more likely to overextend with a much larger um, standard deviation here, right? So they're all over the place. Uh, and then our control was the with physical therapist feedback. So they were right on, but with some more variability. Um, the other one was plane of motion. This is where we saw the most significant results. Um, so plane of motion error is basically being off plane, right? And you don't want to do that because you're compensating and you're not getting the, 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 the benefit from the physical therapy, as far as I understand it. Um, so the average is a little high here because we have this outlier and we think, you know, why we're still processing this data. But uh, we have lower error in, in plane of motion. And, um, um, and that's it. Um, it's a kind of profile slide on, on, on kind of my background and things I'm very, uh, interested in. So I'm basically an engineer who's done a bunch of other things, but I was interested in, in digital health and kind of getting into it. And um, I'm not sure if others have questions, but I wanted to ask. So you, in working with your collaborators in physical therapy and such, how do they see this? as being integrated into the existing system as a supplement or replacing specifically built for sessions um, so, for so individuals system, without access. Correct. Yeah, so, so um, interesting. Um, so I've seen systems kind of both ways. There have seen systems that are used in the clinic to kind of let one physical therapist treat multiple patients at a time at the same time. So this could apply in that case. Our intent was to extend the reach to the home, right? So we don't have objective measures. It's just all self-reporting. Could we send that system home with people to, to exercise? And it could be like a phone app and a sensor you put on. Um, and some proposals have argued as a, a kind of access, meaning, you know, the physical therapists, like I've a, a proposed a remote version of this where the physical therapist is in one place, the patient, we send them the app and the sensors and we can do like a remote session beyond just, visual you know you can see the patient but you can't you can't nudge their arms right so with the sensors you might be able to set target poses and the app will tell them to to go to that pose right um so then potentially there, there might be an access argument here where you can kind of where uh, reach people that are further away from the clinic okay. great thank you very much sure and uh, if there are questions in the chat i'll be happy i'll be responding i'll i'll, I'll look over them and happy to respond wonderful our next presentation is on human artificial intelligence systems for making visual information accessible to individuals with visual impairment. Thanks for uh, 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 inviting me. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anhu Guo. I'm currently a, a first year assistant professor at CSE. So uh, to describe myself, I'm an Asian male with uh, short black hair, wearing glasses and a dark blue shirt. In my background is uh, uh, empty bookshelves of my new office in Baster that I still need to uh, decorate. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about my work on uh, building hybrid human AI systems for accessibility. And also throughout this work, uh, we have been involving and benefited from the expertise of hundreds of blind people as students, researchers, participants, and users. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of a human AI systems that we developed and then give you sort of the more broad uh, scope that we are currently focusing on and some of the other areas that we are starting to look into as I'm establishing my, uh, my lab here. 
So there are many frustrating moments uh, in our life when visual information are not uh, easily accessible. And so for blind people, frustrating accessibility problems because of vision are very commonplace and pervasive. And one of such problems that uh, I'm going to focus on here is that the world is full of physical interfaces that are inaccessible to blind people, uh, from microwaves and information kiosks to thermostats and checkout terminals. So blind people cannot independently access these interfaces because the buttons are actually indistinguishable and the screens contain visual information that cannot be read. And the, uh, making all of these interfaces accessible has been a longstanding challenge in accessibility and many approaches have been attempted to address this problem. So to give you some backgrounds, for example, for home appliances, blind people often add tactile markings with sighted people's assistance, but this doesn't really work when encountering a device uh, that's inaccessible in the wild or uh, you know, that's a dynamic interface that don't have the option to modify it on, uh, modify it on the fly. And creating new devices that are accessible out of the box could also work, such as talking clock, talking microwave, et cetera, but it's unlikely to make it into all devices produced due to cost, let alone there is already a huge substantial legacy problem that's already out there in the real world. And some solutions have been proposed to solve this problem. Uh, prior work have used crowdsourcing to allow blind people to, to connect to a remote person or to ask a question by taking a picture and then getting multiple answers or responses from online cloud workers. But this was not very uh, efficient and effective in this specific use case because you need a lot of back and forth and uh, in order to manipulate the device and the user does not have full understand that the remote person might not have full understanding of what is going on on this machine. And also interface or task specific computer vision solutions have been developed, but they're not always robust or general because of variety of lighting conditions and placement, uh, et cetera. So they require very careful aiming of the camera and very specific use cases could work, but they are not very general and robust in a variety of cases. So the solution that we created uh, kind of could take advantage of both crowdsourcing and computer vision which are, you know, a human intelligence is embedded in sort of crowdsourcing systems and computer vision is one form of artificial intelligence. And then uh, we created this system called VisLens that can allow blind people to access physical interfaces similar to using like a mobile screen reader. Um, so the way a mobile screen reader work is the user can, you know, swipe on the screen, uh, on, for example, on an iPhone or Android uh, device uh, in order to kind of navigate through the different elements on the screen, or the users can drag their finger al on, along the screen to hear what is underneath their finger. So uh, I will play a short video on the left. Uh, it's about how the iOS screen reader works. Settings, App Store, Reminders, Mail, FaceTime. Yeah, so um, using sort of the same analogy uh, here on, the on the right is a video I'm going to play that show you how blind user could use BizLens to access a physical interface like this microwave. Kitchen timer. Kitchen timer in two. Two. Two and five. Five, five and two. Two and five. Two and one. One and two. two one and two. 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 Um, I'm not sure whether the video is playing smoothly, but kind of what, what was happening is the blind user is aiming the, the, their phone on, uh, towards the microwave and they are moving their finger on the physical interface and it is reading out what is exactly underneath the user's finger. So as you can see, um, this lens can provide real-time feedback on what is underneath the user's finger, similar to how a mobile screen re reader work, but using that for making like a physical uh, interface or touchscreen work. So um, the way we combine human machine intelligence in this system is using like a multi-step approach. So for example, first, uh, when the user first encounter an inaccessible interface, they can take a picture, uh, which then will be sent to online crowd workers to provide labels to this interface, like you know, marking the area of the interface that's you know, worth uh, comparing or detecting and labeling the individual buttons on this interface. So uh, once this is done, then this information will be stored and later uh, after this one-time labeling by the crowd workers, VisLens can then rely on computer vision to provide feedback to the user. And the reason computer vision is more likely to work robustly now compared to using a generic uh, approach on any interface is that the problem has been simplified and localized. 
from the general problem that you're trying to provide access to, to any interface in any given context to this much more specific one of this interface in the, typically a similar context like lighting condition, placement, et cetera. So the core functionality of this lens is then to tell the user what is beneath their finger. And we use a set of revision techniques such as to first match uh, uh, the interface that was labeled to the new one in the video stream. And then we find the user's fingertip location, and then we can map um, and kind of uh, look up what was uh, under the user's finger in the previously labeled uh, information. Um, so using this kind of instantaneous feedback, this lens can allow blind users to interactively explore and use a variety of inaccessible interfaces. And so currently, we are also working on deploying this system to the App Store to, to, for blind people to publicly use them. And also through doing so, we want to get a better understanding of um, what are the, the inaccessible devices out there in the, in the wild that blind users want to have access to as well as to collect a data set of the physical interface and interactions um, uh, uh, with devices in the real world. Yes, so we, we used Amazon Mechanical Turk for, for the labeling. So it's part of the system that's uh, uh, kind of on demand invoking responses from, from crowd workers uh, in, the, in the interactive system. And then kind of extending the system further using this same combination of human machine intelligence, we have been able to create an extension uh, called Facade that's uh, allowing blind user to take a picture, but now with a marker, like you know, a credit card or a dollar bill as a standard size. And we are able to automatically generate a 3D printed tactile overlay to help uh, blind users kind of retrofit their existing devices so they don't have to uh, use like existing tactile markers with sighted people's assistance. So this pipeline is also uh, accessible and uh, can be done independently by the blind user. And then uh, extending the problem, uh, extending the solution even further, we also looked into how to make dynamic touchscreens accessible. So we, uh, we created a system that's able to take in usage videos of a touchscreen machine. For example, there's a coffee machine that may have a lot of different functionalities. By capturing a lot of naturalistic usage of, uh, from sighted people of using the machine, you're able to, uh, kind of similar to Google Maps, you're able to gradually reverse engineer a state diagram of how this machine works and then create a conversational agent as well as providing interactive guidance like what you just saw uh, of guiding the blind user to access this machine. And uh, you know, to solve the risk-free uh, uh, touch exploration problem because the user cannot hover reliably on the screen that will accidentally trigger touches, we also created a set of simple uh, 3D printed uh, accessories to help with uh, using inaccessible machines. And we are also exploring other automated uh, solutions such as an accessible phone case uh, that can be mounted to the back of the phone that can be much easier in kind of triggering these kind of uh, uh, touches automatically. And so this idea of this lens, uh, uh, a screen reader interaction of using a finger to access and explore uh, real world information uh, has also been applied more broadly. So when I uh, uh, worked in uh, the accessibility engineering team at Google, uh, they, one of their uh, systems that they have developed and deployed is called Google Lookout and cursor-based interaction is one of the um, uh, functionalities that support blind users in trying to get more specific information around them. Um, so this lens is this human AI example of a human AI system that can support blind users in accessing physical interfaces uh, similar to using a screen reader. And in this case, the human's role is to interpret the interface in arbitrary settings, which is hard for a machine to do arbitrarily or to capture the unique context that's embedded in the environment. And then the machine's job becomes much easier. They can, sim uh, they can simply focus on re-identifying the interface and provide real-time feedback, which is what the machines are best at. So uh, the system combines the best of both worlds, the advantages of humans and computer vision, so that it can be as robust as a human in interpreting the interface and as quick and as low cost uh, as a computer vision system to re-identify the interface and provide feedback. Let me take a look at the chat. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'll get back to that. Yeah, so to take a step back, um, for a lot of the real world problems, uh, such as providing be better access to visual information, uh, we could leverage two kinds of intelligence, artificial intelligence and human intelligence. And AI show a lot of promise 
in recently in understanding the visual world with computer vision and deep learning. So AI has the advantage of being fast and low cost while using human intelligence is generally slower and more expensive. But despite the advantages of AI, there are also huge challenges in applying them in the real world. For example, they often require a huge amount of upfront training data in order to start working. Whereas human can start off more immediately with fewer examples. AI systems also struggle in a lot of uncontrolled cases and do not easily generalize. Uh, whereas humans are more robust to changes and can be flexible in solving the real world problems that cannot be handled uh, by AI just yet. And then by carefully designing hybrid systems that combine the intelligence uh, and advantages of humans and a machine, these systems can be nearly robust and flexible as humans and nearly as quick and as low cost as automated machines. And then, so the human AI lab that I'm currently establishing focus on combining these uh, kinds of intelligence to create interactive systems uh, for solving problems at the intersection of accessibility, artificial intelligence, and augmented reality. And to highlight two of the areas that uh, we work on recently, one is um, really in kind of using accessibility as a driving force uh, for uh, artificial intelligence. So, so accessibility is a unique problem domain uh, because of the challenging constraints, but also the high, super high poten potential value of technology enablers for end users. And oftentimes people with, with disabilities are the early adopters of technologies. Um, before it is like, reaching a level of uh, performance that's able to be ready to use by everyone, like in terms of video captions, voice recognition, image captions, computer vision, a lot of these systems today are already vastly being used by people with disabilities before they are perfect. So by working with people with disabilities to solve these really challenging problems uh, people are facing, these experiences can not only improve their uh, life experiences, but also inform the directions of how to build better and beneficial AI systems. And finally, uh, in addition to developing systems, uh, we are also uh, working on how to push the boundary of accessibility and AI using better data sets, as well as looking into fairness issues uh, in this domain. So uh, a lot of in, in AI, a lot of data sets are created artificially. So I'm I'm uh, collaborating with a variety of AI researchers and, uh, and I'm interested in uh, collaborating with many of you in, in this area to develop data sets that can be useful to develop solutions uh, for people with disabilities that can also be generalized towards AI. And also relatedly, uh, I, I think as our keynote speaker mentioned earlier, uh, fairness, people have focused on a lot on uh, gender race, but not so much for disability. So I've uh, looking to explore this direction and we proposed a roadmap when I uh, was visiting Microsoft Research in what is the roadmap for addressing uh, fairness issues of AI systems for people with disabilities. And uh, so how to collect data uh, ethically and effectively, and also wh what are the ways, uh, what are the challenges and trade-offs in uh, evaluating fairness uh, in this uh, very uh, complicated a context because it's, it's a spectrum and people can have multiple disabilities and all these additional challenges that are uh, unique in this context. And uh, yeah, so I'm interested in exploring these. And that's and, that. Right, thank you so much. There's obviously so much here. We look forward to hearing more about your research through the center and in the future and uh, helping you find collaborations. Um, and you. to getting your research on these devices for both you and uh, the previous pre presenter integrated into our systems to really transform our healthcare. Uh, Dr. McKee, can you provide us the, the next update with regard to our presentation, the disability tab? Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for having me. Um, so this has been a great symposium and learning a lot of uh, innovative ideas um, while also highlighting some of the gaps. And so I'm um, going to be talking on behalf of our disability and accommodations my chart tab team. Um, so we really are trying to make ourselves be more proactive, not reactive, um, especially in the provision of accommodations. And so um, in terms with that being said, I wanted to just highlight the team. Uh, so we have um, Dr. Michelle Mead, um, Heather Halkides, um, Krista Moran, Dr. Tyler James, Sophia Park, and Michelle Thomas have been uh, vital um, 
you know, committee members on this. And so unfortunately, as you're aware, uh, there's really no formal or systematic way to identify patients with disabilities and also their uh, needs or accommodations in our uh, my chart uh, and also within the institution as well. And so obviously in order to move the needle, uh, we really need to make sure we ensure that we have accessible, effective and satisfactory uh, healthcare experiences. And the way to do that is to um, not only identify and also make sure that we can um, effectively uh, um, provide the, uh, the needs and accommodation they need. So we're already uh, now 30 years out of um, past the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And yet, uh, despite that, we are still struggling with not only uh, very spotty provisions of um, accommodations, but there are a lot of negative experiences that we have heard uh, throughout this morning. There are three that I just wanted to highlight uh, that I, I feel are areas that we need to tackle. This is a very complex problem. There are other factors beyond just the attitudinal accessibility and awareness issues. Uh, but I just want to highlight these three um, and what the disability tab, I think, will help to indirectly or directly influence these areas as well. So the attitudinal, um, some of you may have already uh, seen the recent publication in the Health of Bears uh, by, that was led by Dr. Ayasoni and found that 82.4% of physicians reported that people with uh, disability have worse quality of life than their non-disabled people. So there's this uh, conception or notion that our lives are worse, undervalued, unworthy, and that actually is something that is perpetuated through society and among our healthcare uh, workforce. And though uh, the other thing uh, that is important to understand is that the provision of accessible facilities and communications, um, again, remains spotty. There are numerous publications talking about how well we're providing accommodations um, or the accessibility of our uh, facilities. Um, there is actually one example uh, where um, this one publication was talking about that 22% of healthcare facilities was completely inaccessible for somebody in a wheelchair. I mean, we're talking about even getting into this facility and that's just wrong. And so um, obviously with the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, there are obviously a lot of focus on the accessibility and these are reasonable modifications uh, that we're trying to um, adjust the clinic facilities, make sure that these are mandates that they have to follow. And these could be um, making sure that there's adequate time to adjust imaging equipment to allow somebody to get a mammogram, for example. Um, the effective communication is also really critical, and that may include the, um, the need for an interpreter for a deaf individual or the use of a large print. And then uh, the accessible uh, facilities, that's also uh, something that you heard that even almost uh, one in five facilities were just completely inaccessible. So obviously with the, uh, the last part, we heard me about the importance of awareness awareness among healthcare providers. Uh, we are not doing a great job in training. Uh, we are still um, struggling with not knowing how to effectively care for these individuals. We really don't know how to effectively communicate with these individuals. We also don't really know um, many of these individuals have a disability. Uh, and an example of individuals with hearing loss, many of them are hidden disabilities, but have huge ramifications on whether they adhere, follow our recommendations, or even inappropriate healthcare uh, uses. So we have a long way to go, um, but the good news is that there are areas that we can target. And with this particular, um, with this uh, particular tab, which I'll show you in a second, um, we have ability to influence all three of those areas. So we just recently did a, um, a convenience sample, um, a survey that was distributed among the family medicine providers and staff, in addition to uh, physical medicine rehabilitation staff and providers. And so we were able to get uh, roughly about 46 uh, responses. And this was really just to get a pulse and understand um, how providers and staff are learning about patients' disabilities and their needs and how they are going about to address those accommodation requests. And uh, what we found is that the main findings from the providers is that most of them frequently learn about patient disability status and accommodations 
often by assumptions being informed by the patient or completing uh, some exam, usually a head to toe assessment. But you can imagine uh, a lot of this is last minute inability to make um, adequate um, provision of accommodations. Some of this requires advance notice or to have uh, some ability to adapt equipment or even the patient room. Um, and then the clinic staff uh, most frequently learned about patient disability status and accommodations uh, needs through, again, assuming and being informed by the patient or having the information missed during the workflow. That last part is uh, concerning because it often becomes a negative experience. They hear after the fact. And what we're trying to do is avoid these negative um, experiences. So um, in terms of the ability with the um, unaware to of the need for combinations is the one that um, was highlighted as being number one for clinical staff, uh, while it was the fourth leading barrier for healthcare providers. So we are not doing a great job here at this institution in order to facilitate, identify, and help these um, individuals to have equitable and quality care. So I wanted to talk about the effort around the My Chart Disability Accommodations tab. So this is a mock uh, patient, big birdie uh, bird. And so as you can see in this red square uh, that I highlighted, this is prime real estate. And I'm thrilled that we were able to have this place here. So this disability accommodations, small tab under the uh, pronoun gender identity. And uh, despite being in prime real estate, a lot of people don't realize that this is already live and it's already available, but we are still rolling out some training. And I'll talk about that in a second. So what you can do is highlight uh, the different types of disabilities and um, in the drop box, you can list the accommodations that they are required. So when the next time you're in the my chart, uh, for those of you who are providers or staff members, you can take a look and uh, get familiar with this, um, this step. So here's what happens when you select uh, disability accommodations tab, it actually pulls up this uh, disability type and depending on what you select, uh, there will be a drop down box that you can add additional information. Keep in mind that many of these accommodations are pretty simple. They can be um, easily you know, incorporated in our appointments. But again, the key notice is uh, the notification is what we need to do is be notified, hopefully in advance, so that we can incorporate this more seamlessly in our clinical care. Um, and the services that we provide. Um, so this is live again. Um, so please feel free to start using it. We are um, now moving on to making efforts to try to get people trained so they know what to do with this uh, tool. Uh, before I go any uh, further, I'm gonna talk about some steps that we are doing. Um, I wanted to highlight um, that we have some ways to go to help the staff and providers know where to uh, get additional information, where they can request these accommodations. Sometimes it's equipment, sometimes it's services. And um, fortunately for providers, um, about half or so um, actually was not very competent in terms of um, their ability to get the accommodations, where to reach out to. So there is a gap um, and many of them struggle. And unfortunately, many of these circumstances probably end up in failure to provide the accommodations for these individuals. Staff members uh, did a little bit better in terms of knowing, but again, there were some, there were still concerns um, in terms of knowing where to reach out. So obviously we wanna make sure that they are agree, strongly agree in knowing where to reach out and where to get these services. So what we're doing right now, uh, we are already rolling out um, to at the Dexter Health Center, one of our family medicine uh, clinics, and also PMR at Burlington will be uh, rolled out uh, soon as well. We've already identified staff champions to work on workflow issues. We understand just like with any other steps, um, you know, uh, healthcare can be a little unwieldy. Any changes often there's met with resistance, um, but with these staff champions, uh, we're going to work and identify these workflow issues so that it becomes easier for other clinics that we roll out to. This is gonna be rolled out in October. Um, this will be a quality improvement project. And uh, we will also do a list of any gaps needs so that we can help to identify or highlight services or equipment that may be needed at subsequent clinics. 
So this may uh, be an example of a personal sound amplification product. It may be, um, again, uh, making sure that we need larger print. Um, so all of these will uh, be identified and we will share these uh, resources in the future. Um, obviously, in order to address the provider and staff in knowing how to provide these accommodations, we need to have resources um, available for them. So some of that will be in the clinical page uh, within Michigan Medicine, and some of that will also be available at a SAP. We're still trying to identify what is the best way for SAP members. Um, and so feel free to provide us comments or suggestions as well. And then lastly, um, what we expect will happen is as we identify gaps, uh, this will hopefully um, highlight the need for certain equipment like adjustable exam tables or other equipment and maybe even expand some of the services, whether like interpreter uh, department to, and we'll have to make sure that Michigan Medicine leadership is aware. And so there's gonna be efforts uh, there and hopefully relay that and make it easier for all of us to do the job that we need to do. So the other thing is uh, the call center right now has been centralized, uh, but the effort eventually is going to be, the scheduler is going to be asking questions. Do you have a disability? Uh, yes or no. And if so, what type of disability? And that is the key time. So when you schedule an appointment, that's when we should start thinking about provision of accommodations. And then uh, we are also going to be working on workflow issues, the preview of schedules, appointments that have already um, been set by the staff and providers. And so we're going to figure out what would be what makes the most sense. And that probably will vary uh, from specialty to specialty. And then last, we have Michigan Medicine, ADA, and Disability uh, Coordinator is something we're going to strive for. So I'm going to stop well, here. Um, and then if you have any questions or if you want to uh, be part of this team, we are looking for clinical champions. Uh, please feel free to email me. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put it in the chat. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. McKee. I think this is a really, um, this is a critical work where one of the first uh, healthcare se systems in the country to be doing this, despite it, the need being documented and the research evidence. So it's a very exciting and important initiative. Uh, our last presenter today is Dr. Lisa Reber, who will be talking, presenting the it's People's Attitudes, Challenges Encountered by Adults with Physical Disabilities. Thank you. I'm a postdoctoral uh, research fellow. My name is uh, Lisa Reber. And I'm working under the supervision of Dr. Mead. And I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm a white woman uh, with slightly graying hair and a black top, and I'm sitting in my home office. In any case, as I said, I'm sitting in my home office and I use the pronouns she and her. Um, I'm going to raise up and hopefully reinforce uh, some of the issues that Dr. Forber, uh, Forber Pratt and other speakers brought up. And I'll do this in the context of the study we're currently conducting. And so specifically, I'm going to um, address the importance of the hard to reach, uh, the need to hear stories, not just numbers, the need as researchers to understand and acknowledge our positionality and to do so reflexively, and the need to include members of the community in the research process. The study I'll discuss is part of a broader project that seeks to understand the factors that impact healthy aging among adults with long-term physical disabilities from low-income and racially marginalized communities. In conducting research with underrepresented communities, uh, we think it's important to purposefully include those populations in research. They're often left out, uh, even though people of color have higher incidence of disability than white folks and are more likely to be low-income and in poverty. And from the ivory tower of academia, it's far easier to access white middle-class participants, but this population has already been centered in research. For the study we're uh, conducting, um, our two research sites are Flint and Detroit. Both uh, cities are majority African-American, 54% in Detroit or Flint and 79% in, in Detroit. Our final sample, 
Flint were spot on uh, at 55%, and Detroit was at least in the ballpark. Um, so point one, uh, who we include. We need to include the hard to reach um, and keep them in our research and center them there. Point two, um, do numbers of stories provide the best information about the research question? Qualitative inquiries can help us understand the subtle nuances that generally don't emerge in quantitative studies. They can illuminate people's interpretations, um, their perceptions, their experiences. And by doing so, they give us evidence for examining how their experiences differ from other groups and perhaps even why. Dr. Carson Beard, Bird is a senior fellow in residence here at the University of Michigan, and he examines race and educational inequality. He's a, a quantitative researcher, but he said that while he was in college, he often wondered about the importance of numbers and what they say about how a group was constructed. Dr. Beard said how he wondered how the interpretation of the numbers overrode a wealth of qualitative data. He also added that what is rarely heard and sometimes kind of seen as abnormal are the actual voices, the people and their experiences. Instead, the numbers tell the stories for the people argued in an arguably dehumanizing way that make people interchangeable. The issues and concerns that emerged in our study did so through encouraging conversation and actively listening. Doing so led to the emergence of one important overarching factor the challenges of the attitudinal environment. The ICF states that the attitudinal factors are at the root of an unaccommodating physical environment brought about by attitudes and other features of the social environment. When we refer to the attitudinal environment, we're referring to individual people and the society at large and the attitudes they have towards people with disability. Individual attitudes impact choices about the built environment. They impact social policies, and these in turn impact individual attitudes. The attitudes that people with disability perceive can both facilitate and be a barrier to engaging with society. When we started analyzing the data we gathered, we didn't go into it searching specifically for the attitudinal environment. It emerged as we coded. This diagram reflects some of the key attitudinal themes that are in the process of emerging. Uh, they run along a continuum. At the far left, we have understanding, and this refers to participants perceiving individuals and society as being understanding. It could, for example, take the form of positive supports participants received in the provision of accommodations, and when those without disabilities advocated for them and for reducing ableism. A lack of understanding in the middle reflects participants' perception that people without disabilities fail to recognize their needs and even fail to recognize them as a population. Most often this was experienced at the macro level in the form of insufficient funding for their needs and a narrow view of what those needs should be. And at the far right, we have the stigmatizing beliefs. And this reflects what participants saw as the assumptions and stereotypes made by able-bodied. They felt the society viewed them as less, often in terms of what it meant to be human, leading them to be seen as less deserving and of less value. Separation between the categories is, of course, a bit blurred and not always clear. You can't always determine whether a comment by a participant is not understanding or stigmatizing beliefs. And that's reflected in the um, gray square, bluish gray square at the bottom of the diagram. The third point is the researcher. I'm a white woman without a disability with a middle-class background. I do not reflect the target population. And because of that, it's extremely important to always be cognizant of two things, my positionality and the need to be reflexive. Positionality has to do with how we see and understand the world. These are colored by our values and beliefs, and these are shaped by our political allegiances, religious faith, gender, sexuality, historical and geographical location, ethnicity, race, social class, abilities, and so on. 
Reflexivity, on the other hand, requires a self-assessment by the researcher about our views and positions and how they might, may, or have, directly or indirectly, influenced the design, execution, and interpretation of our findings. When we reflexively engage in examining our positionality, we acknowledge and disclose ourselves in our research and our influence on it. Without a doubt, it's been participants' attention to the attitudinal environment that has increased and reinforced my concerns with the importance of positionality and reflexivity. But it's not just qualitative researchers who need to acknowledge this um, about our positionality and engaging reflexivity. Dr. Bird also stated, numbers are messy. The decisions that we make are messy. Every decision that we make is part of an agenda. So we need to reach the hard to reach. We need to hear their stories. We need to understand our positionality. But doing so in isolation and in ivory tower can be a bit difficult. Which brings me to the final point. Who is included in the research process? While the subject of our study is adults with physical disabilities from low income and racially marginalized communities, the object of our study is society. That which, was, that which is composed of the able-bodied and often white portion of society. I'm a member of that society. There are things we scrutinize while coding and analyzing the data, things that every now and then, once in a while I go, Lordy B, I've done that, I felt that. As a white able-bodied woman, I can't all of a sudden overcome racism and ableism. It's an ongoing journey, both as a member of society and as a researcher. Hence, the importance of engaging those from the community. From the beginning of our study, uh, we recognized the importance of this and we hired community liaisons. Both are African-American, advocates for people without disability. One has a physical disability and the other has worked extensively in the disability and disability organizations. Um, their inclusion has been important, however, it's through my discussions with them and my engagement in the data about the attitudinal environment that I've come to recognize that while contributions by members of the community, as we have with our liaisons and the assistance of a white research associate with a physical disability, while their contributions have been important, when it comes to addressing the complex intersecting components of identity and society, I wish we could have taken it a step further. We would have benefited from the inclusion of a scholar whose race and ability reflect our target population. Bringing together personal experience and scholarly knowledge uh, about the issues. So to sum up, we need to change how we think about and approach healthcare research. We need to tend to disparities and include the harder reach. We need to remember, as one of my professors used to say, numbers can kill, or at least they can dehumanize. Who are the voices behind the numbers? We need to remember our positionality. I believe I do have a lot to contribute to our field, but I must be reflexive about how my positionality impacts participants, data, and my interpretations. And finally, when possible, we need to include those with whom we are doing research about, and that includes scholars who reflect the communities we study. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reber, for that important and powerful presentation. Um, I think it nicely brings us in a circle to where we started this morning and what the voices or the message was from uh, Dr. Forber Pratt. Um, this is our last presentation of the day. Uh, we will be going into breakout groups. How many depends on how many are able to stay. Um, but we do welcome you to once again, continue this discussion. We welcome you to come to and participate in our monthly meetings and to use the Center for Disability Health and Wellness as in a place to connect with one another, continue to advocate for change within our health system and our field and to find a supportive community environment. 
I'll hopefully see many of you within the disability or within the discussion sessions.